Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. I am with Father Stephen DeYoung again. This is, I believe, our third conversation. For anyone who doesn't know, which I doubt is not very many people at this moment, but Father Stephen DeYoung is a Eastern Orthodox priest at um, in Lafayette, Louisiana. Am I getting that correct? Mm-hmm. And you are the host of the Lord of Spirits podcast and all around internet personality, and I'm sure a real life personality and a teacher of Jordan Peterson, the mysteries of the <laughs> resurrection and other such things of that nature. Uh, so I thought I actually would ask you about that first. Uh, what, what did you think of Symbolic World Con and how, how, what, what were yeah. your reflections upon your interactions with the, the great Dr. Jordan Peterson? Yeah, yeah, Peugeot Fest. Uh, the, <laughs> um, well, it, it's, I haven't had a ton of time to reflect because I've got so much craziness going on. Um, but uh, part of the, part of the sort of uncanniness of the experience for me was that it was sort of very professional and uh, top flight. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I'm like getting picked up by a car at the hotel and like coming into the venue through the kitchen, like, which kind of felt like spinal <laughs> tap. Like I was worried we were going to get lost <laughs> somewhere, um, you know, and that kind of thing, which was kind of odd um, for me. Uh, and I I don't know, I, I think... I'd be curious to have someone secretly record when I'm not ar- around what uh, Peterson thought about me because I just, I have this thing where other than a couple of people, like I famous people are just sort of people to me. And like, mm-hmm. I definitely do not think of myself as a famous person, which is part of why that got so surreal. But mm-hmm. I also don't think of other people as famous people, just as people. Yeah. And like tend to just talk to them as people. So I don't know if people who have adjusted to being famous people, if that's weird to them. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, I mean, in terms of my speaking, it was just kind of normal speaking to me. Um, I, di- I didn't really get to know Jordan Peterson. It's not like, you know, we became pals or something or had mm-hmm. pretty much all of our interactions if you got a virtual ticket to Pajot Fest, you saw. Yeah, yeah. Like, literally, you saw pretty much all of it. That's, um, and so, I mean, I picked up these little things about him. Like, he's a close talker. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has a very close yeah. conversational distance. Um, you can actually he, see that in the video that leaked of that Q&A. Like, when he came yeah. on stage, like, I kept backing up and he kept getting closer. <laughs> like until I realized what was happening and stopped, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was, yeah. It was interesting. I mean, I was, you know, trying to convert him to Christianity. Um, as one might expect. <laughs> so. that, I mean, he, I think he respects, uh, he has a certain respect for clergy and people in the vestments and uh and that sort of thing um and so i i think that he was taking you quite seriously for that reason uh but he he does the thing when he wants to ask a question what he means is i get to talk for 15 or 20 minutes (laughs) and then if you have something to say afterwards that's all nice and well but um uh, let me first give you a mini lecture to me it kind of seemed like he was thinking out loud yes you know yes. what I mean? Like where somebody would normally sit there and think for a few minutes and then ask their question. Mm-hmm. He would sort of think it out loud and then eventually arrive at the question, you know, like at the mm-hmm. end of the sort of, yeah. So that that's how it kind of read to me. <laughs> that's yeah. And he tended to, he tended to talk to like everybody. Whereas I sort of just, focused on talking to him and I'm like other people could watch me talk to you but yeah yeah <laughs> right so yeah I also feel like maybe he needed to have been given a lecture spot or something um, because he didn't have his own uh, you know 45 minute time slot or longer 
uh, yeah. he kind of <laughs> had some pent up thoughts on his uh, that he needed to get off his chest. And so he was taking the Q&A to do that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. There was another, for people who didn't have tickets, I had another hour and a half conversation with him on stage mm -hmm. Saturday morning. I don't know if any of that stuff is actually going to get I sort of general it. public yeah. release later. I would assume eventually it will, but I don't know what eventually means. Mm -hmm. um, could be like Blu-rays of Disney Plus shows. You know, you're going to be <laughs> yeah. waiting years. Yeah, or or bootlegs of Grateful Dead concerts or something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there may be that, and in that vein, there may already be some kind of uh, Southeast Asian version on eBay on <laughs> DVD available. I, I um, don't know. I'm pretty clued in to these circles, and I haven't seen anyone who, okay. who recorded that thing. I, I got the a video of your Q and A pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, but uh, someone did on their cell phone. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, but not the longer one. <laughs> All right, so. One question, one topic I wanted to talk to you about tonight, the prologue of John. What is what is up with the prologue of John and what does it mean? And uh, I, I've sent you my uh, take on it. And you've also had some episodes. I'm not sure if you ever had an episode that like solely focused on the prologue, but you've had no. maybe episodes about logos or something like that, which dug into it pretty deeply that I can remember listening to. Um and I have to say, like, you know, a lot of my interpretation of the prologue, uh, one of my major influences that I credit is Father John Bear. And I think that there's a lot that an Eastern Orthodox folks could make of my interpretation, while they might not want to go whole hog with me on a couple of things, <laughs> but that there is a, uh, a strong overlap that I think could be made. But my main wariness with my own interpretation is that I've never quite heard anyone argue that before or t my take before. And even I am not so bold as to think that going boldly where no one has gone in the last 2000 years is necessarily a, a good idea unless you have no other options. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I still think, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll guess I, I'll give, I'll, I'll keep this monologue short, but for anyone who, who doesn't know, me, my general take as a biblical Unitarian on the prologue of John is that it's telling two stories simultaneously. And that in the beginning is like a double, it's a wordplay. It's referencing Genesis, but it's also referencing the beginning of Jesus's ministry, the way that the Gospel of Mark starts with the beginning of you know the gospel of Jesus Christ and that sort of thing and that the events of the prologue have like an old testament referent and also a gospel of John new testament referent and that there's this double layer wordplay that goes on throughout the prologue was sort of the point that the acts of the logos in the old testament are a foretype or a foreshadow of the acts of Jesus in the New Testament. And really the primary focus of the prologue is sort of like a, um, I don't know, a snapshot of everything that's going to happen in the rest of the gospel um, and a background simultaneously. Uh, and that that is sort of the main purpose of the prologue. And then this sort of gives me a, a Unitarian out, you could say, although I don't feel like it's an out, I feel like it's an in, but of saying that it's not actually about the pre-existence of Jesus. That there is, of course, a connection between the Logos and Jesus, and the Logos pre-exists Jesus. And yes, the Logos is like a title, or even like a metonym, or something like that, for Jesus in the prologue, because the Logos is working in and through Jesus in the New Testament. But that doesn't mean that Jesus was the Logos in the Old Testament is sort of my basic take. And I, I, I'm not going to go through a verse by verse on that. But yeah. when it talks about all things come to be through him and without him, nothing came to be. That's sort of like God creating everything by speaking in the Old Testament and like the book of Genesis. And that's God creating through his word. But it's also like the new creation and blessings and grace and salvation and the Holy Spirit and like all of the good new things of the new covenant come to be through Jesus. And there's no other place that you can get it except through Jesus and that sort of thing. And, and there's a lot of those double word plays throughout the prologue. 
So that's yeah. sort of my general take. Uh, and I'm wondering how close we can get and what we <laughs> what we disagree about and uh, what I might be getting wrong. Yeah. So uh, I think I sent you, I think there's in certain places, especially with your understanding of the Old, the old Testament part of it, there are certain affinities with the way Daniel Boyarin, mm -hmm. the Jewish scholar, sort of works through it, where he he sees the, the logos there as being... So for him, he takes it slightly different direction that he sees the logos as the Torah. No. But no. that's a way of talking about the Torah. And so it's talking about the Torah being given and then rejected and <laughs> right. Yeah. And, yeah. and then coming home. And then Jesus is sort of an embodiment of the Torah. Yeah. Right. That's sort of the the argument. So I think there's some affin mm -hmm. affinities there between what you're saying and and how he was reading yeah. it. Um, so I, I think the big, I think the biggest disagreement, um, and I went back and, and watched parts at least of your presentation again, <laughs> since I knew we were going to talk about this, um, to sort of refresh, refresh my mind because it had been a minute, um, is I, I think you see the logos in more philosophical terms, Specifically, you you use sort of the Stoic understanding of the logos as sort of a taking off point, mm -hmm. um, which definitely has that approach has a pedigree in 20th century scholarship for sure. Right, you're not just mm -hmm. that's not part that you made up on your own. That no, you no, that's actually perhaps the most well cited yeah. part of my yeah. presentation. Yeah. Um, but it's a part I disagree with. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's, um, because I tend to see uh, logo, and part of part of this has to do with Johannine studies. Mm -hmm. uh, that since the Dead Sea Scrolls became a factor, there's been a major shift in Johannine studies to seeing uh, Saint John's Gospel as the most Jewish of the Gospels, whereas for most of the 20th century, it was seen as the least Jewish and the most Greek. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so part of that reconsideration has been seeing the logos in terms of the memra in the in the targums and the way that the concept of the the debari in in hebrew right the the uh, the memra in aramaic is used for these visual and physical manifestations of God mm -hmm. uh, in in the Old Testament that nonetheless don't bring about the death of the people who are seeing right. or encountering or, or touching the physical manifestation. Like it's a manifestation of God's presence that perhaps isn't somehow the fullness of God's presence, but is still kind of nevertheless God. Yeah, both and identified so with and distinguished from Yes. <laughs> the God right. of Israel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that to me. So, for example, the biggest place, of, I, I think that the crux of our two different perspectives is, and I've heard you say this more than once, is that if I'm remembering right, it's 118 about either the Monoyanis, Theos, or Eos. Yeah. It doesn't matter to me which one of those you choose, right? Either way, right? Mm -hmm. Where you've said several times you think that verse is a real problem for Trinitarians. And literally, that's one of the first verses I quote when I'm trying to explain the Trinity from the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that shows that we're coming at it from different angles, yeah. right? So or that me, I'm arguing with a different kind of Trinitarian, I suppose, maybe when I'm that, making that that's point. That's true, too. That's true, yeah. too, right? Mm -hmm. um, monarchical Trinitarianism does have a different way of approaching. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I take that verse as a summary of, right, no one has seen God, i.e. the Father. Right. right, who St. John will later refer to as the only true God, right? Yeah. Um, no one has seen the Father at any time, but whether we want to call him the Son or God. And in Second Temple Judaism, the term God was applied much more liberally than we 
are comfortable right. with. <laughs> yes. yes. Modern Christians of yeah. any type. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yes. That that there this other figure, right, is the one who appeared to those the people in the Old Testament. That other mm-hmm. figure is the one who is now made flesh, right, in Jesus Christ. And that made flesh, to me, this is the key of the anti docetism passage, passages. Yeah. I've actually got a journal article I'm working on related to this in First John in another piece mm-hmm. of Johannian literature. One of the issues with docetism and trying to understand exactly what docetism was is that when St. Ignatius talks about it, in addition to obviously the central thing we think about with docetism, that that Jesus was like an ethereal (laughs) spiritual being Mm -hmm. and not actual flesh, he also says that they rigorously kept the Torah. Mm -hmm. Like they kept kosher. Yeah, he does seem to correlate Judaizing with docetism. Yeah. And... Although I, I I will say I I've been talking with some scholars about the Ignatian corpus. And yeah. you know, there's the three letter versus the seven letter dispute. Right. I will yeah, say yeah. the the anti docetic and anti Judaizing rhetoric is not in the three letter collection. It's yeah. just like yeah. not a concern there. Yeah. But someone at some point in time. Whether yeah. it was Ignatius or someone pretending to be Ignatius, even if we leave that question aside, there was someone who was correlating at docetism with uh, yeah. Judaizing. Talking about some group of people who held these things together, right? Yeah. And so and that is mostly confounded people because the sort of modern traditional view of who the docetists were is that they're some kind of Gnostics or proto-Gnostics. Mm-hmm. Right. And then they're right. like, well, why would proto Gnostics be keeping? <laughs> right? Because mm-hmm. in general, most of those Gnostic groups were Marcionites. So they would have done the opposite. No. Right. No. Um, so what I'm doing in the journal article is I'm making an argument that this is actually talking about a Jewish group. Yeah. No. It's talking about a group of Jewish Christians that was seeing Jesus as sort of another Old Testament theophany. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Like Abraham saw God as this human right jesus is the same kind of thing (laughs) right and so i think the stuff that's been interpreted as anti-docetism even in the prologue right the word becomes flesh right is trying to differentiate jesus right so to say there's continuities right there's some kind of continuity of identity of jesus Mm -hmm. with these old testament appearances but also the birth and life and death and resurrection of Jesus is also different significantly from those old Testament appearances. Yes. And And it's interesting. (laughs) Yeah. In in both the prologue and in first John, when he's talking about Jesus's fleshliness, he often calls in himself as an eyewitness at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we beheld his glory. Uh, and then in First John one, it's you know whom we touched and whom we saw, and you know all the tactile first person we language again, calling in himself and others as witnesses to the fleshliness of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, and so that's basically my read of it, and I think where the differentiation would be because I would think you would not see a continuity of identity. You would see other continuities, but not identity per se. Yeah. And I I would say, yeah, like there is a distinction in identity in my take between Jesus and the Logos, but they're getting pretty close uh, in terms of Jesus's connection with the Logos in the Gospel of John once it is flesh. Uh, And I suppose one of my takes would be that the Logos pre-Jesus is not like a person, is not a is not a distinct interactive personality apart from God the Father or something like that, but is more like a a manifestation or an activity of God as opposed to a, I don't know, personality. And that in Jesus now, the Logos kind of has a personality that is the human Jesus. Uh, And you can kind of like, there's maybe I would even say some sort of fusion or new thing that happens between Jesus and the Logos, but that, 
and, and like this is where it gets pretty close and we're at some point it's like man we're really splitting hairs at some point the difference here um yeah. but i might also say that i'm not sure if when it says the the word became flesh i'm not sure if like that's referring to a specific point in time or if it's more something like in that presentation, or you, you know, you can kind of just translate that as the word was flesh. Uh, became, there are some Greek grammatical reasons that have been pointed out to me since my presentation that normally noun, ginomai noun, means first noun changes into second noun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there are some exceptions, it turns out, to even that rule. Uh, yeah. that, <laughs> so um, it can be noun was noun. Uh, and so yeah. Jesus was flesh. And again, like I sort of argue that it's maybe just an anti-docetic point to say this logos that I've been talking about this whole time, this Jesus as the logos, he was flesh, lest you get any, you know, mistaken ideas about this. And, but if I were to be forced to say when I think maybe the like the logos and Jesus take up some special relationship, I would point to the baptism as making more contextual and theological sense than say the conception or something like that. Yeah. Um, so my, my follow up, my follow up question would be then, so then who is it who sits and eats with Abraham? Is that just God? I think that is an angel. I would say it's one of the angels and of the three angels, there seems to be one angel that's more important than the other two. Um, so the three angels that dine with Abraham and are playing various roles in the Sodom and Gomorrah buildup, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, that I think that they are just three angels and one appears to be more important than the others. Yeah. And it could even be the case that one of them is like bearing God's name. Like there are like in Exodus, there is an angel yeah. that goes before them that bears God's name. So when it says Yahweh rained down fire from Yahweh in heaven, like right. a way that I could interpret that is that the angel of the three that was uniquely bearing God's authority, you know, rained down the fire from. And so that's yeah. it's like two powers ish, but not like not full blown two powers, because who knows like what that angel was and ranked to other angels or God can maybe right. put in and remove his name from angels as need be. And so, so that would be the way that I would take that example. But would you say that's not the same figure then as the logos? I don't think so. No. Okay. It, it's so there, it's there never are called places. the logos or anything like that. Right. There are places though in the Old Testament where it talks about the the Debario appearing to people. Right. And even at one point touching Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So that seems to indicate there's some kind of tactile, you know, appearance and physicality mm -hmm. to the logos, at least in those. Now, you may disagree with the way the Targums generalized that, right? Yeah, yeah. It sort of lumped everything into that box. But there are a few cases where that is indicated. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. And I could handle that in a couple of different ways. I could say, you know, in the same way that God could put his name in an angel, he could put his word in an angel or something like that. Like the angel is bearing the prophetic speaking authority of God, sort of just like when a prophet comes and speaks the word of God, it's like the word of God came and it was Elijah speaking or something like that. And that it's, it's not necessarily that that angel that is tactile, uh, is like the capital W word of God, which is this angelic figure, which then will become incarnate in Christ. But it is an angel who's speaking in God's authority. And so it's like the word of God came to them. And it's someone who bears the ability to speak on God's behalf. Okay. And then the, the, the flip side of that is then with Jesus resurrection appearances. Mm hmm where he does things like say handle me or eats in front of them to show that he's not a spirit yeah that he's physically raised from the dead if you've got angels doing that in the old testament how does that work right 
So, I mean, I, I, I suppose that you and I might not disagree about that. I think that Jesus eating, uh, so like one, the world doesn't mean that Jesus has a spiritual body. And uh, I have some, I have some friends that saw your speech in Florida that were like, what? Father DeYoung was completely spiritualizing away the resurrection. And I'm like, I have, a, I suspect that that's not what he was doing, but I also yeah. can understand <laughs> how from a certain theological background that would, that would sound like that's what he was doing right if you yes. think on the grid you're yeah yes uh and that i can imagine maybe 20 year old myself coming across that speech and maybe feeling similar uh but upon further theological development i know more about what you're trying to say so that okay so jesus has a spiritual body as it says like three or four times as clear as a bell in first corinthians 15 yeah um but yet thomas can touch it it can eat fish, but it can also kind of go through walls. Uh, you know, it's sort of a weird kind of thing that the apostles seem to struggle to describe fully. Uh, they can describe some amount of it. And so is Jesus the same sort of thing now that an angel is now? Part of me thinks not. I think that there is something more human about him, even in his resurrected state than what an angel is like, even if an angel can seemingly have meals in Abraham's tent that Sarah cooked. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, what do you think of that question? <laughs> well, so this is one of the things that makes people's brains explode on Lord of Spirits the few times we've talked about it, right? I, I think that the person who sat and ate with Abraham was Jesus in his resurrected body. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's that's how I handle it, right? Is that, that I don't so he think there's actually this... a pre-incarnate Christ. So I could agree with you on the the Yuname thing, right? And John the, mm -hmm. the become, right? And and this is stressed in a lot of Orthodox liturgics. It says he became man without change or alteration, mm -hmm. right? In the incarnation. I generally and take that to assume that the divine nature doesn't change. No, his person did not undergo change or alteration. So what's the difference between <laughs> Jesus pre-resurrection and post-resurrection? Well, if you accept Jesus as divine, then for him there is not a pre and post. But do right? He returns Jesus to the glory he shared with the Father before the world was, meaning... Meaning that, right, so there, there are eternal realities. And this gets into the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. There are eternal realities, and then they manifest at some point for us as humans and the way humans experience time. Mm -hmm. This is why it makes people's heads crack or think we're galaxy-brained, one of the two. But didn't, he, <laughs> but didn't Jesus have a, a natural body or a, a, a psychical body? as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, and then he sure. has a spiritual body? Well, I, I don't think spiritual... This is part of how I read 1 Corinthians 15 as a whole, and really most of the New Testament. I think spirit and spiritual almost always need to have a capital S. Mm -hmm. So it's not referring to a spiritual body in the sense of a body that is somehow also a spirit. Right, like spirit is a genus, right? Right, right. Um, I agree with that. But spiritual in the sense that it is in some way permeated, characterized, transfigured by the Holy Spirit. Yes, right. That that's what it means to be resurrected with a spiritual body, and we will be resurrected with a spiritual body. Right, that's right. different we, than our psychical bodies. Right, right. So we have our current body that is animated by our soul right, our psyche, our life that animates our body now. And in the age to come, it will be the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God himself, right? This is deification language, essentially, right? That is animating mm -hmm. and, and transfigure our body. Mm -hmm. So yes, Christ had a human soul so, that was animating, has a so, human so body. So his human body, human soul. for the 30-ish years then, you're saying he still had 
a psychical body that was animated by his human soul, but wasn't yeah. animated by the Holy Spirit in that way. Not in the same way. It was not manifested okay. to us as humans, right? Right. But it was still there somewhere? This is, well, this is part of the, so one of the prayers we pray all the time <laughs> as Orthodox priests is talking about when Jesus was dead. Mm -hmm. And we say his body was in the grave. Mm -hmm. his soul was in Hades mm -hmm. and as God, he was in paradise with the thief and with on the throne with the father and the spirit. It's a lot of places to be at one time. Exactly. And we say then at the end of that, filling all things. <laughs> right. And this is part of our interpretation of what St. Paul says, he who descended also ascended. So he would fill all things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and Christ having filled all things with himself. Right. So, yeah. So for us, right, there is not, it's not that during, right, the life and ministry of Jesus. So if we go to 23 AD, the person Jesus is only there at that one point in space and time, right, in Galilee, say, <laughs> right. Uh, that's where, his human body is that you can go there and interact with him and shake his hand and eat with him and hear him speak in the normal way of hearing, you know, vibrations carried through the air. Um, but he's also everywhere and filling all things at the same time. Mm -hmm. From our perspective of time. Right. right. And I would say that Jesus gets to that filling all things point after his ascension. Right. <laughs> right. Like that there, yeah. there's yeah. this utter transformation both in Jesus and in Jesus's relationship to the cosmos and in the cosmos itself because of Jesus's own ascension, deification, enthronement, etc. Right. And I would say, I would agree with most of that except the change in Jesus, right? That's the, mm -hmm. <laughs> without change or alteration. Yeah. Yeah, and that's Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Unless you limit yesterday to literally yesterday, right? When he I, 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 I can give it a couple <laughs> decades. I yeah, exactly. Right. I Where don't I'm, need to say one day. I think, yeah. you know, it's like for the last little while. <laughs> I would take that as more programmatic, right? As far as you go to the past, as far as you go to the future, right? Yeah. As long as you've known him, audience of Hebrews, you know, it's been the yeah, same. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a perfectly plausible interpretation. <laughs> Although, I, I mean, I would say that the book of Hebrews also seems to be against those same combination of docetists and Judaizers. I think that that would make the first couple yeah. chapters of, of Hebrews make a ton of sense of why he seems to be both simultaneously arguing against taking Jesus to be an angel and against falling back into the law. Yeah. I, I think that's, I mean, I, I, some of the details of falling back into the law, I would, mm -hmm. but <laughs> that's um, maybe quibble about, but that's a whole other, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think in, in what, same as what I was saying with St. John, I read that as right attempts that would be natural to a Jewish person at that time to sort of slot Jesus into these already existing categories in Jewish thought mm -hmm. of a, oh an angel oh <laughs> a sort of yeah. non-physical manifestation of God oh right and saying no 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 Jesus is different and higher and greater than any of those yeah sort of previous pre-existing concepts. I sometimes wonder if some of the docetists might have had actually what you could call more of like a possession Christology. Like um, Shepherd of Hermas seems to have this kind of weird distinction between this human guy and this Holy Spirit son of God, where the son of God is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit descends into this person and then seemingly leaves him but don't worry that that human person will get justly rewarded for his uh for his dutiful obedience to the the son of god spirit that was in him for yeah. a period of time yeah, and that sort of Corinthian, yeah yeah 
that's sort of like yeah, the the, the yeah. son of God spirit is a thing. It like possesses this human, perhaps from the baptism to just before the crucifixion, and then leaves him again. Yeah, 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 and that's yeah. They're they're, they're probably. I mean, there's a big debate in in especially surrounding First John who the who the opponents are. Yeah. Um, and that is one of the suggestions mm -hmm. is that it's, it's people with that kind of Serinthian Christology. View. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there are traditions about, uh, these sort of bad confrontations between St. John and Serinthus, like in person that are probably more based around conflict of ideas than <laughs> yes. actual historical run-ins. Um, but yeah, <laughs> All right, so I'm going to pull up John 10 uh, because I feel oh, like yeah, this we disagree is, about this. Yeah. This is <laughs> this is highly related to our beliefs about uh, the connection between G Jesus and the logos. And uh, yes. so Jesus says, "I and the Father are one." Uh, interesting statement. The Jews picked up stones again to stone yeah. him. I like I like the again. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God, or a God, like God. It's a little bit unclear. Um, divine. Jesus yeah, divine. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God's. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. If I'm not doing the works of my father and don't believe me, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. So to me, this is like, my zero in focus of like the word of God here, which, and this is one of the, I think this might be the only place in the gospel of John where it says the word of God, uh, the logos of oh, God. The prologue. Yeah. 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 Cause I don't even think the, the prologue ever calls, I mean, it, it has word and God, but it never uses oh, yeah, that yeah. possessive no, yeah, construction. Have, yeah. Yeah. yeah, logos the ooh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this is the only time that you get a possessive construction like word of God. And so, and Jesus, at least at some level, seems to be distinguishing himself, or at least not immediately jumping to identify himself, I would say, uh, as well, see, this yeah, word. See, of I God. disagree with that. I think he is. I yeah. All right. So so tell me what how you take this passage. Right. So well, so first I have a I have a basic principle in new testament interpretation which is if you're trying to understand how the new testament is quoting something from the old testament you go and you exegete the old testament passage first mm -hmm. and then you presume that the new testament author is is quoting it correctly <laughs> right um which sounds obvious but is not the most common approach. I and I think Even there are sometimes where that approach it has its failures because the, sometimes the New Testament authors do te seem to find a new meaning. I, I guess is. Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't think they do. I don't think they do. <laughs> I think. I think if you take an approach that requires them to, that's a knock against your approach. And, right. and this is one of, of the ways I critique Calvinists on Romans because yes, St. Paul has to just be playing completely fast and loose with the Old Testament every time he references it in Romans for the Calvinist reading to be true. And I think that there are multiple examples where texts from the Old Testament have their original context meaning and reference and then get reapplied often to Jesus. Like Hebrews 1, I think, is probably the best example. Like, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Like, I think that that was probably about Hezekiah or someone Hezekiah adjacent in the Old Testament, and that you can imagine the Jews having sung that to various kings 
uh, as a courtly song of praise to the kings. Yeah. And then, oh, it also now can refer to Jesus in this sort of Christological reinterpretation. Well, I don't think that's a Christological reinterpretation because you just said Christological. No, well, yeah, I mean, he is the Davidic king. He's the Messiah. Right. So that's the same application. And you see, I think that <laughs> like there, there's like this level at which like King Hezekiah, he didn't reign forever. Um, right. And, and it's a little hyperbolic maybe at points uh, yeah. to be totally about that human king on that throne. And right. so that's like within the realm of poetic royal um, hymnology. Uh, right. But yet it has a truer, full, non-hyperbolic meaning when applied to Jesus. Right. And so that's how I understand that. Or said is the fulfill mm -hmm. the fulfillment, right? Yeah. And like, for example, when you compare what's called the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel, uh, I believe 7, and uh and cro and uh, first chronicles. Right. In 2 Samuel, it says, A son of your flesh will sit on your throne forever. In Chronicles, it says, A son of your flesh will sit on my throne forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Coming from the prophet. Right. And so, certainly, the throne of Israel belongs to God. Right. We can see that. Mm -hmm. so. But that applies sort of fully to Jesus, right, as the Messiah, right, who sits on the throne of God, right, in addition yeah. to. Right, the throne of Israel. But so to me, that's not a radical reinterpretation, right? That's not yeah. taking a passage that meant one thing clearly and saying, oh no, it actually means this other All right. So totally how about thing. how about Hagar and uh and uh Ishmael and Isaac and sons of the promise and stuff? Is that Galatians four or five? Yeah, where well, that's the place where St. Paul actually says this is an allegory. He does say this. Right. Is an like allegory. he says yes. that outright. He says, yes. I'm doing an allegory here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Like I'm doing a thing. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. So to me, that would be an exception where he says it's an exception. Right. He doesn't say that other places. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say that about when he's referencing Abraham being reckoned righteous for his faithfulness right what about uh he's christ not doing was... an allegory there he means it very directly right that that's what, what about happened. christ was the rock in first corinthians is that 11 or 12 oh see i, I 11 so if you go back and read that story the story is about yahweh coming and standing on the rock when it struck with the rod of judgment so from my point of view, in terms of how I see New Testament Christology, St. Paul is saying that was Christ standing on the rock. <laughs> That's, and the striking of the rock with the rod of judgment is related to uh, the death of Christ, that he's actually finding Christ in the Old Testament there. He's not rather than doing a... You see, a, I, I, I think that this, like, this whole passage is sort of doing this weird allegory, even though it's weird that it's speaking in the past tense. Like, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. It's like, I don't think that he's saying that Moses, like, baptized them. I think he's saying that baptism now, like, that was a foreshadow, a foretype, an allegory for us being baptized now. Right. And so he's using the word baptized in a new covenant sense, but he's talking about it in the past tense doing with this typological allegorical relationship right. similar to Hagar and Sarah and, and the covenants. I Yeah, see, I take... Well, first of all, that's not a quote, right? So we were originally talking about mm. quotes, right? And interpreting the quote in its original context first. So this isn't a quote. But also, again, I would take it a little more literally. I think they at that point, they entered into a covenant with Moses as the mediator, right? And in baptism, you're entering into a new covenant of which Christ is the mediator. Right, and that that's the relationship. Right. And that's an actual but, parallel, not just an allegory, right? You like, see, yeah, and I would take it more, more of an allegory. <laughs> and like ate spiritual food and drank the spiritual drink. Okay, so that's like manna and the water being right. symbols for blood and, and the Eucharist bread. And right. again... John there, six it, makes the same comparison. John, right, right. right. Yeah. Same, and that, that's yeah. not unique. And then they drink from the spiritual rock. Like it wasn't a spiritual rock. It wasn't a pneumatical rock. 
I well, don't think that's what you mean by spiritual again. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that's why I think that for spiritual, one of the spiritual one of the one of the meanings or one of the ways that Paul uses spiritual is when he's talking about in terms of allegory, like mapping. Oh, see that, yeah, see that I don't agree with. I don't think spiritual means allegorical. I think I, spiritual or, means the holy the Holy Spirit. He, it was the power of the Holy Spirit that was bringing the water out of the rock. But the the rock was spiritual. Spiritual. The sense capital S. Yeah, the power okay. of the Holy see, Spirit is operating within yeah, the rock. Yeah, I just don't. I just don't think that that's right. I think he's saying like drinking the the them in the desert drinking from the rock is like us drinking from Christ now, and that it's again it's very similar to the Hagar Sarah covenants thing that he's right. saying typological thing from the past we can understand it now, and that he uses that spiritual word as a cue to let you know that he's doing that allegorical yeah. relationship comparison. I don't know. I could be wrong about this, but I'd have to be presented with some evidence of someone else in Second Temple Jewish circles using spiritual to mean allegorical or not literal. Or well, like because I don't know of anyone who uses it that way. So I, I suppose I don't necessarily mean that spiritual and allegorical are synonyms. I think that there is the the typological relationship between the earthly and the spiritual, and the earthly being the old covenant, basically. And the new covenant being the spiritual, like Jesus says, I, if I've told you earthly things and you don't understand, why, what are you going to do if I tell you heavenly things? And that yeah. I think that heavenly and spiritual are pretty synonymous in that way. And so when he's saying spiritual rock, he's like, the spiritual rock is what the rock in the Old Testament in the earthly layer relates to in the spiritual layer. And the spiritual thing that the rock in the Old Testament relates to is us drinking from Christ now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I, this is actually the place of maybe our biggest disagreement, <laughs> especially when it comes to the Athanasius thing, is I think Platonic metaphysics is completely incompatible with Christianity. Um, so how is you, that necessarily You, I think, platonic. believe it undergirds Christianity. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the, I mean... <laughs> You're you're a, you're a curious Eastern Orthodox folk who doesn't no, particularly no, like I'm not. Uh, Platonic I'm not. metaphysics. You're saying you're not you're not a unique per you're uh, not at all, not at all. Okay. Vladimir Lasky's mystical theology of the Eastern Church. His whole thesis is that the main distinguisher of Western Christianity is that it's Platonist. Hmm. But he, he used the word mystical, so he must like Platonism. That was a joke <laughs> for the record. <laughs> That does not compute, right? Um, but yeah, well, and it's it's because Platonic metaphysics cannot understand the idea of the incarnation. Now, you're not wedded to the idea of the incarnation personally. So I, 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 yeah, it's like I, that's to less me, of that's, that's sort of a, a, yeah, it's yeah. a weird tangential, uh, you know, uh, yeah. a rock to throw. It, man, I'm like, okay, that yeah, that exactly. arrow just right. completely went and hit a different right. target, but, right? Yes, but so right, so if if you accept that in some sense the the incarnation is a bedrock doctrine of Christianity. To me, that makes Platonic metaphysics, and of course, Eastern Orthodox people, the incarnation is the core of right. Christianity. And, right. and so. I will maybe partly agree with where you're going, and that like it's not like I'm saying that the earthly things point to the heavenly things and never the two shall mix, or that There's never a participation we get to... there in good Platonic right. style. Because but, yeah. Jesus, Jesus <laughs> was down here, the spiritual yeah. heavenly thing was Jesus walking around and that wine that the, that Corinthian church is drinking like literally physically drinking is the spiritual referent that Paul is pointing at so it's not like i'm saying that spiritual and heavenly is only up in some platonic realm yeah. that we have only perhaps some faint access to that's not where i'm going right. but right. that there is sort of this you know, prototype archetype relationship yeah. going on in the way that Paul and Hebrews and John relate the Old Testament symbols to the New Testament realities in Christ. But it, it was still down here. Uh, right. But it was clear of a, the up there is down here. And so if if, if that counts as me believing in the arc incarnation, then I'll, I'll go that far. But <laughs> Well, no, I, I'm more that... So... 
this is this is a disagreement i think too like i don't i i think the old testament realities were realities too mm -hmm. right, right. I, I don't have that same well i would say that, that the, the reality is here and that was not i think that was the reality then and there's a reality now and that reality has changed in profound ways <laughs> right yeah but and it's, I, I, I don't, I don't see that same relate to me. The, the category rather than spiritual and physical, or it's see, I see this in terms of imaging. I see this in terms of icon. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's not quite the same thing. Right. So the earthly sanctuary, like the tabernacle is the yeah, icon I was about to bring that sanctuary. up. Yeah. 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 Is the icon of the heavenly sanctuary. And then the, right. the heavenly sanctuary is the spiritual sanctuary, you could say. Right. But and that's what that's I exactly don't think that how makes I think it more Paul, real. <laughs> well, I think and I'm not sure if more real. I don't need to yeah. like marry myself to that because the New Testament never quite says that. But there is something it's more permanent. That's that's one thing. And I would also well, say everything eternal is yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but also our my my current body is as real as those Old Testament symbols, but my future pneumatical body, my future spiritual body, it has bears the same relationship to me now that the earthly tabernacle bears to the heavenly tabernacle, or that that rock in the desert bore and the water that came out of it bore to Jesus's blood being drunk in the Eucharist. But for me, the relationship of my body now and my body in the resurrection is one of identity. But there's Hence a the change. bodily resurrection. It is my yeah, body well, still. It's the so same maybe, body. Yeah, you're right. So maybe I don't want to quite go that far. But that there, our current bodies are perishable, just as the same way that a temple could be torn down. Um, and that a rock could be broken uh, in half, say, uh, but that the future things are eternal and will never go away, will never perish. And so there is something a little bit more real about them in that sense, at least of greater importance and glory and eternal weight. Glory, yes. Glory, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I see it more in terms of metamorphoses. Yeah. But you want to yeah. get back to John 10? All right, let's go back to yeah. where we are in First Corinthians ten, yeah. which is relevant though. To yeah, no, it was, this was a it was not an irrelevant 10. discussion, but yeah. all right, and we can flip over to Psalm eighty two if we want yeah. to also. So this is going to be part of how we read Psalm eighty two, but I read Psalm eighty two very directly. Right, God stands in the council of the gods. <laughs> right, in the council of gods, he renders judgment. Right. And that's where he says, you are gods yeah, and sons of the most high. Right. But you have done, right. You've done these wicked things. Judgment is coming, right. You have been called gods, but you will die like men. Right. And then it ends with arise, O God. In the Greek, that's actually honesty, like anastasis. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, arise, O oh God, uh, judge the earth, because you will inherit from all the nations. Right, and so, in context, I, I understand this to be talking about this is the judgment of the gods or the death of the gods. Mm -hmm. Tons of old Testament scholarship agrees with me on this, mm -hmm. uh, and that this is talking about God judging the gods of the nations. Yes, the and the heavenly the, court. Uh, right, the, the, the divine court. council for Heiser fans, yeah, right, and, and so they're judged, they're thrown down, and then God's inheritance extends to all the he takes back possession of all the nations, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so this is actually sung by on Holy Saturday in the Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. right before we read the gospel reading, mm -hmm. and the gospel reading is from Matthew 28. With Christ saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. 
Yeah, interesting. Right. So if that's our understanding of what's going on in this text, and we take that to John 10, right? Then when he says, those to whom the word of God came, those to whom the logos that who came are called gods, right? I understand that to be a comparative, right? If if those are called gods, like the gods of the nations who are judged, and that the logos the who is the one who's sort of coming, right, delivering this message, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. from God, right? Then why would you say it's wrong for me to essentially say that I'm God? I'm the son of God. And, or that I'm the son of God. And, and and to me, that's implying his identity with the logos the who in keeping with John's prologue, right? So if those were called gods, those who were being judged, then how much more is the one who brought that judgment rightly called? the son of God mm -hmm. and, and able to say he's one of the father. That's, that's my reading of John 10. So, but how is the, where's the, I don't quite see the connection then between Jesus identifying himself with the word of God that visited those gods. Well, if it, I mean, how then would you see that quotation as relating to their discussion? So the way that I take it, and I'll I'll say I I'm not wholesale rejecting like divine council theology or something, uh, or the view that there are gods of the nations that can be called gods and that sort of thing. I'm not wholesale uh, poo pooing that at all. But there is also a Jewish tradition that interprets interprets this about being a judgment against human judges being called gods. Yeah, and it's that, a later that Jewish is, tradition, but yeah, <laughs> it exists. Yeah, there, yeah. there's a, there's a. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I was going to call it a minority report. I don't know if it's a minority or majority. There's an alternative report. Uh, depends on what community. Yeah, depends the community on what community. The church fathers. It's a minority report. If it's Jew, rabbinic Judaism, it's probably the majority report. <laughs> right. So I would say what Jesus is. So Jesus has said something, you know, I and the father are one and Jesus, like, as I've mentioned in the gospel of John, this happens all the time. Jesus says something weird or bizarre. Um, uh, it, a high Everybody team. freaks out. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> freaks out. And then Jesus tries to clarify himself. Um, and that often fails to work. And that this is one of the prime examples of that. But, you know, John 8 is another perfect example of a very similar thing. Um, and so the argument that I understand Jesus making is if we go with a, I said you are gods, is God the Father speaking to human judges, calling them gods in a lowercase g sense. And we could say, I know that you might not agree with this, but there are a couple other times where it could be argued in the Old Testament where yeah, human judges are the reference yeah, of, uh, of the word Elohim. Um, and uh, our friend Jacob has uh, strong opinions on that. Um, you know, like the ear piercing of the yeah. slave scene being, you know, perhaps one example. Yeah. I read that um, as the spirits of dead ancestors, just to be as controversial as possible, but go ahead. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so if we just accept the idea that perhaps humans can be called Elohim, especially humans that seem to be representing God in some special authoritative sense, like the way a king or a judge could, then Jesus is referencing a passage where that happens, that maybe these uh, Pharisees would agree with. And so Jesus is saying, if it's okay for occasionally humans to be called God, then it is even less blasphemous that I'm not even calling myself God, like your accusation. I'm the one whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world. For the record, I don't understand that as an incarnational sending from outside the world and into the world. I would view that as Jesus was baptized by the Holy Spirit and then sent into Jerusalem, basically, to do his thing, <laughs> right? That That's yeah. how I understand consecrated, consecrated at the baptism and then sent, you know, to onto the scene is often the way into the world often functions as onto the scene or where the yeah. attention of the people are in the gospel of John. 
And so him, whom the father of consecrated and sent into the world, is it blasphemy if humans can be called gods occasionally? I'm just calling myself the son of God, which is seemingly, we could agree, a less exalted term than just God. God. So how would that be blasphemous for me to call myself the son of God? And then in typical fashion, they don't seem to understand or agree with him or be uh, dispassionately persuaded by his rhetoric. And then they get mad at him and he has to escape. Yeah. So my, my reading takes this more like John 6, where he says, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they freak out and he just doubles down on it. Mm -hmm. But he's doubling <laughs> down. But I would say that the yeah. audience is sort of understanding, like, are we supposed to go up and eat him now? You know, like there is a literal interpretation right. of what he's saying that's absurd. Right. But and, he doesn't say, oh, I don't mean it literally. Oh, I don't. Right. Right. He but says, I, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But and you and I, leave, you and, and I, say, come back. That's, right. You and I would agree that that's referring to the Eucharist, which hasn't right. been instantiated yet. So right. there is a meaning that is not obvious to them. And the right. obvious meaning to them is like, go up and eat him. <laughs> and but he doesn't that's feel not what he means. Yeah. He doesn't feel the need to explain that though. Even right. when they're leaving, he doesn't say, wait, come back, come back. Let me explain. Yes. Right. He asks the disciples if they're going to leave too. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I read this the same way. Not as him saying like, wait, wait. No, look, look, like, you know, I mean, people get called gods all the time. You guys are gods, kind of, <laughs> right? You know, like, put the rocks down, right? I read it as, right, no, he ex doubles down on it, <laughs> right, <laughs> on his initial statement, right? Mm -hmm. That that there is this oneness and there is this unity between him and God the Father and that he is, right, divine, <laughs> in, a, in a sense so Bart Ehrman agrees with me but <laughs> yeah, yeah. for whatever that's worth I don't know Occasion occasionally he even agrees with me too so yeah uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah um so but I I still so I don't quite see what what I still think is difficult for your interpretation if he called them gods to whom the word of God came he seems to be referring to the word of God there in the third person and not in the first right. person. Because he's referring to, in my interpretation, the way they would have read it. Mm -hmm. That they would have read this as, oh, when it says God comes and stands in the council, of the God, this is referring to the Memra, right? This is referring to the Debar Yahweh. But he doesn't say, right. if he called them gods to whom I previously came. Right. No, he doesn't say that. No, yeah. but I'm not saying he says that, right? He's saying, mm -hmm. but he's, that would be that would be clearer and more in line with your argument. Right. But it so, seems well, no, that less... would make it blatant. Then there would be no need to for an argument. Then we would be having this discussion, <laughs> right? right? He said that, right? But but it seems example. more plausible in my direction the fact that he doesn't do that. That, right. that he but, leaves a distance between him and the Word of God. What he says to what he says to the Pharisees. Uh, you know, it quotes the first verse of Psalm 110. Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. You know, if the Messiah is the son of David, why does David call him Lord? Mm -hmm. Right. That doesn't mean he's saying he's not the Messiah because he refers to the Messiah in the third person. Fair. Right. He's he's citing to them their interpretation. Right. He says, you guys believe that's talking about the Messiah. Yeah. Right. 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 So I'm saying he's doing the same thing here. You guys believe that there, this is talking about the word of God. Okay, I will grant, Jesus them. does often talk about the Messiah in the third person. Yeah. that That is a fair point. But there, so there's a parallelism here, right, that Jesus is making. All right, we've got the Psalm 82 thing where um, God, he, and I presume he is God the Father, God the Father or at least the prof the whoever is whoever is talking in the first person in Psalm eighty two. Maybe you and I could agree that's God the Father talking. Um, if, yeah, yeah. If He, God the Father, called them gods to whom the word of God came, and Scripture cannot be broken, do you say of Him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? So the parallel yeah. seems to be 
where Jesus is paralleling himself, he's not paralleling himself to the word of God. He's paralleling himself to the people who get called gods. And that his no, argument I, is I that think, they get called gods. I'm getting called son of God. That's a I lesser. He's, he's paralleling he whom the father consecrated and sent into the world with the logos theu. Because in Psalm 82, the logos theu would be the one who God the father sent to the council of the gods. Mm hmm. But then why is right. he bringing so, up that they get called gods? Because it seems to be that he's right. paralleling beneath, getting called God with getting called son of God. Right. They're they're beneath the logos the U. Mm -hmm. Right. The logos the U is of a higher order than they are, and they get called gods. Right. Yeah. So then why would it be inappropriate to call the one whom God consecrated and sent into the world the son of God? if it was appropriate for those below that figure to be called gods. Hmm. Okay. So that's you're how saying I'm that, 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 that I may he... not be correct, but that's how All I'm right. reading it. <laughs> I see. I, okay. I see. I see your point. All right. So in John one, I guess, and this is the part where I'm not sure how much we disagree or not that do, do you in general think that like my old testament new testament parallelism is part of what's going on or i could imagine because that's very similar to me saying like the spiritual rock is a allegory relationship between the rock in the sinai desert and jesus i'm saying that this allegory relationship is also connecting the Old Testament events to the New Testament events in my reading of the prologue. And yeah. since you seem somewhat down on that idea, <laughs> I'm well, wondering I, if I, you're down on the idea uh, as a broad parallelism for the whole prologue. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't think we agree about the relationship between the two, but I would agree that the two are at play mm -hmm. from my person. So I, I think fundamental to, the apostolic claim that Jesus is the Messiah. There are sort of three fundamental pieces to that, that, that Jesus embodies uh, the God of Israel in a unique way, that he embodies the Torah in a unique way, and that he embodies Israel itself in a unique way. Yeah, and I, so I, I agree the, with all three of those unique ways. Yeah. And so there, there is built into that, especially that third part, that the experience of Jesus, right? And in the sense in which the prologue is giving in short form the sort of arc of the gospel that's going to follow, mm -hmm. right? Like he came to his own and his own received him not. That is a description of the life of Jesus, but that's also a parallel between the life of Jesus and, right, the history of the way the Torah the way, was received by the, the way, Jewish yeah, the people way in the past. he embodies the Torah yeah. and and the history of Israel, yeah. right? So there's an agreement there. I don't know that when we get into the details and the nuances of the relationship between the two, we probably disagree. But that mm -hmm. those things are at play, I think we we agree that a lot of this agreement is, about yeah is parallelism. Parallel, there is parallelism and four type archetype sort of relationships. Yeah. yeah. Um, why, what do you make of John the Baptist showing up in the prologue in verse six? And then again, a little bit later on. Um, in, Once the narrative starts, he's yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, so the, the common read, especially the, well, even now, I was going to say the 20th century, but even now the common read of critical scholars is that, you know, this is, you know, John the Baptist was more popular than Jesus or something. So they're trying to put him down and make him subservient to Jesus. And I don't, I don't think that's accurate, but I, I think that he was a critically important figure mm -hmm. more than is generally realized. <laughs> that's um, he has kind of an elevated veneration in the Orthodox church um, that I think is tied to trying to preserve some of that sense Mm -hmm. of just how important a figure he is 
in the life of Christ to the story of redemption. One and could I say think, that no greater person was ever born to women than. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, which is not nothing. Right. And, yeah. and, um, and so I think if the more we reappropriate that sense of how important he was in the, his, in the first century and the history and the beginnings of Christianity and the life of Jesus, the less weird that'll seem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I think the reason it seems odd that he's so prominent and that he pops up is that we've sort of lost sight of his actual prominence. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Um, so I agree with his prominence, but it, to me, like him popping up in verse six makes me think that the primary referent of even verses one through five, then is a time near to John the Baptist and not eternity past. And that eternity past or the Genesis beginning is like a, a an interesting foreshadow. And that, again, it has that parallel relationship. But the primary focus of the prologue is the New Testament story and the New Testament beginning and the New Testament coming. Yeah. not uh, And the new creation, I would even say, as opposed to Genesis creation. And that way, the narrative timeline flows smoothly instead of talking about the beginning of the world in Genesis, skipping ahead to 30 AD and to this John the Baptist figure, then going back to Exodus and then skipping back ahead to John the Baptist. And then back, and it's like the timeline is completely wonky unless we have a primary yeah. New Testament referent for the whole uh, 1 through 18 passage with yeah. Old Testament parallelism as a, um, poetic flavor adding, you know, theological meaning or something like that. Yeah. The difficulty for me with that, with, with St. John is that he's traditionally seen it. I see him more as the end of the old covenant than the beginning of the new. Mm -hmm. He is sort of the book end. Right. And I would be more prone to see like, you know, anarchy, the beginning of the book of the Genesis, and then here's the book end of <laughs> right, the old covenant. Right here's the other end. That, yeah, that ends up but with, but the Gospel of Mark does runner. that same thing. You know, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and where do we start? We're going to start with the baptism. Yeah, uh, by John. Oh no, that's true. That's true. Yeah. The other the other thing is the way Saint John writes, uh, which is uh, he has this his his writing style both in narrative and in like prose, like in, in the epistles, it's most obvious. Of course, second and third John are so short talking mm -hmm. about structures kind of weird, but you can see it in first John. He writes, it's not really cyclical. It's more like a spiral or like a corkscrew. Yeah. Like he yeah. sort of circles around things like does these cycles where, where, but they kind of narrow and hone in right. Like on a, on a theme. Like in First John, he'll bring up a topic, and then kind of move on to something else, and then come back to it, mm -hmm. and then move right. on again and talk about some of the other things he talked about in the first right, and 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 to me, that's the only way of explaining some of the weird things in the narrative of the Gospel of John, like Christ cleansing the temple at the beginning of his ministry instead of the end. Yeah. <laughs> right like that's the first thing he does in saint john's gospel and it's one of the last things he does and one of the reasons they kill him in the synoptics mm -hmm. um is that he has he's not going for this kind of linear a to b kind of argument the way saint paul writes an epistle <laughs> right yeah. he, he's it's this sort of cyclical Sure. Right, thing. Yeah. So, so I would say that it's even possible, right? So you could have something that's going from like Genesis to St. John and then goes back to Exodus and cycles around it, right? And that kind of loops like that. That would be entirely possible within the way St. John writes, even though it, it does seem weird to us. That's not how we would right. write something. And so like when, you know, he seems to bring in John the Baptist. There's a man sent by God whose name was John. He came as a uh, to as a witness to bear witness about the light, and so he's bringing up light right after verses four and five, where he's talking about, or well, verse five, or yeah, verses four and five that mention this light, and so right. 
to me, it's like, well, the light that's mentioned in verse four was the, the light of men, the light shines in the darkness. This is the same light that John's bearing witness to. Which and is John, coming into the world. Yeah. Which is coming into the world. And then again, Jesus, that he's about to go on the scene. He's right, about to right. come to public attention. Not like he's moving from heaven, not in the world, to incarnated now in the world. But he's about to, you know, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson is about to come on, come into the world as soon as he starts tweeting about some Canadian uh, bill about pronouns or something like that. Um, and so then this light is also the life. And this life is the thing that all things were made. And the thing that which is all things are made is in the beginning. And then the beginning is in the word. So you, you can very easily daisy chain from John the Baptist bearing witness about the light to the beginning. And that seems to make sense to me that the beginning that were that the, is the primary focus of John 1.1. 1, 1. And again, I agree that there's this Old Testament layer that is intentionally in play, but the primary referent is the beginning that John the Baptist is going to bear witness to, which is in, you know, call it 30 AD-ish. Yeah, I, I think there's... There's a dynamic going on there because I don't think St. John thinks that there, that light wasn't around in the Old Testament. Right. Right. So it's not just that that light shows up now in the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Right. But there is still a sense where it comes into the world. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. It, it, right. So it's sort of like what he says, you know, a new commandment I give you to love one another, but this is not a new commandment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, new and yeah, it's not yeah. new at the same time. Right, right? right. Or when toward the end of the prologue, he says, you know, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have received grace after grace. Right. Mm -hmm. That yeah. he's not saying the law came through Moses. Boo. Right? Grace and truth right. came through Jesus. Yay. Right. But that it's uh, there's a continuity there. But there's also something new happening. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is this continuity with what's been happening all the way along. Right. But now it's entering this new phase. And St. John the Foreigner is this pivot point. Yeah. At the end of what's been happening and bearing witness to what's now going to happen, mm -hmm. which is new and not new at the same time. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I think one one thing that I, I don't think that this was in the presentation I gave to the UCA, but it might have been in my longer video that I connect this with the um, the miracle of of the wine where that and like grace upon grace after grace. That's sort of like the new covenant is an extra helping of grace after this uh, original helping of grace. Um, and it's very similar to this wine that Jesus created out of uh, the water is this extra double great uh, wine yeah. to add to Why the would party? You the good stuff for last, yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> and, and that that yeah, the the party gets to keep going, hooray! But it's even better wine, you know. So in some sense, it's the same party, and in some sense, it's still wine. So there's yeah. continuity, but there's also this distinguishing factor that the the first wine, yeah. you know, grew on vines and was fermented, and the second wine just sort of comes to be through through Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and, and, and the Greek word Kani that gets translated as new, right? It, it doesn't have the exact same lexical domain as the English word new. Mm -hmm. It carries with it a lot more like the idea of fresh, right? Or even renewed, right? So, and I, and I think that's theologically important. Like, even when we talk about the new creation, it's not that like this creation is done away with. Right. And then there's this other thing that takes its place because there was something wrong with it. It's that creation is renewed. Right. Made fresh. Yeah, and again. You see, made, I have a stronger yeah. distinction, I think, between yeah. old creation and yeah. new creation than you do. Yeah. Yeah. I think. No, I, was, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because and this is an orthodox thing is that it's more of a transfiguration. We compare it more to the transfiguration. Right. That. Christ on, on Mount Tabor, right, is it, what they see there is the resurrected Christ, essentially, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, and 
and, and so we see this creation and our bodies as being transfigured in the power of the Holy Spirit, who is God, right, himself. And that's part of what the divinization or deification or theosis, right, is. Mm -hmm. Right, the transfiguration of this creation. So, yeah, I think I'm more on the continuity side and you're more on the discontinuity side of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that where that creates more of a sense of narrative continuity for you. And for me, it creates a dualism that allows me to see two layers in the narrative. I think so. Uh, yeah. I think that's probably. Yeah. Narrowing in on our disagreement. Yeah. <laughs> that is. It's interesting. So, I mean, I've read some Maximus, the confessor. I haven't read everything, but I've read Jordan Daniel Wood's book. Although I will say, I guess he's a Catholic technically, but I hear you yeah. Orthodox folks also like Maximus the Confessor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we may read him a little differently, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but like in Maximus, or at least Maximus as interpreted to me through Jordan Daniel Wood, <laughs> it places a heavy emphasis on creation happening on the cross. And yeah. when I was reading that, I was like, holy smokes. Like that is so bizarrely similar to some of the things that I grew up with that I thought, was unique biblical Unitarian, perhaps almost suspiciously uniquely biblical Unitarian <laughs> exegesis, uh, was to imagine that really the act of creation is on the cross, and that's when Jesus himself gets newly created, and then he is the first fruits of, and the example of which we will follow, that is the things that were made in him was life, right? The, the new life, the eternal life comes to be right there and then, and yeah. then, and then we're invited into that, and we have this now and not yet sort of situation in yeah. the meantime. Yeah. Well, and, and you could hold to that and still see a great deal of content continuity in a sense of transfiguration, right? I mean, that's but but that's particularly clear in when you read Saint John's account of the crucifixion. Around the crucifixion, he starts just grabbing all this language from Genesis. Mm -hmm. Like even, even right. The last, so it's earlier in St. John's gospel where among the many times where someone comes and complains to him that he or his disciples are doing something on the Sabbath that they shouldn't be doing. Right. Which is just this repeated thing over and over again. But it's in St. John's gospel where he says that the father is working even to that day. Mm -hmm. Right. And that he is working. And then it's St. John who has his last word on the, the cross being uh, Tetelestai, right? Which yeah. is, it translated as it is finished, but that's the same verb that's used in the Septuagint of Genesis at the beginning of chapter two, when it says God finished his work mm -hmm. and rested on the seventh day where Christ that's is going to rest in cool. the tomb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it has the word it, it has the word telos in it, right? That's sort yeah. of the core of yeah. the word to and finish to, to yeah. bring to completion or to purpose or something. Right. Yeah. And so there's this idea in St. John's Gospel that that's where the completion is. He rests the tomb. But even even the dialogue involving the Theotokos, right? Throughout St. John's Gospel, and it's funny, this is I, I imagine this doesn't happen as much in Protestant circles, but at least in Orthodox circles, and I'd imagine in some Roman Catholic circles, they don't like that through a lot of St. John's Gospel, he keeps calling, Christ keeps calling his mother woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, woman, what, you know? <laughs> right? and mm, why is he talking to his mother that way? Right? And then when he's on the cross, he says, St. John, behold, your mother. Yeah. So he goes from calling her woman to calling her mother, and that's exactly what happens with Right, Eve's name is actually Isha, is actually woman, up until the expulsion from paradise. And then she's given the name Eve, which means mother, hmm. Hmm. because she's the mother of all living. So St. John even picks up things like that from, Gen right, from Genesis. That's, that's a fascinating detail. And you see, to me, I feel like this is backing up my, my dualism a little bit here <laughs> by, 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 by saying things like that. Like, that the old creation was finished on, you know, the seventh day and that, and it was to telosified. Um, and then Jesus says it's telosified. And that, that's my very rough, crude English transliteration. Woodenly literal. Yeah. Yeah. Woodenly literal transliteration. 
and that that it's paralleling again these creations and that you know the second one is grace upon grace the second yeah. one is uh of heaven spiritual pneumatic eternal glorious and the first one was not bad it was good god says it was good very good even but like this new thing is now the eternal thing that all of that was kind of for and pointing towards right whereas, whereas i see again more continent it's renewed <laughs> right mm -hmm. refresh and i would point out for example saint paul says you and i are a new creation now yes if we've been baptized yeah right. and i would say that's like we have our new man our new inner self our new christ in us now and right. we still have our old self and it's the right. weird tension of that and at the, the resurrection the like on the mount of transfiguration that new will emerge yeah right mm -hmm. so honestly when i present these sorts of ideas at unitarian conferences there's more than a few dispensationalists around and uh, believe it or not, Unitarian Dispensationalism is a thing. I was going to say thing. Unitarian Dispensationalists are a thing, huh? It's <laughs> a thing. I actually grew up very Dispensationalist, okay. uh, fun fact. Um, and so there's more than a few people who share my background and have a, a Unitarian Dispensationalism. And they don't like my typology stuff at all because they, yeah, they want to have, separate that. Yeah. They want to separate that and they have much more a sense of narrative continuity and even almost like a weird sort of inferiority about the Christian covenant compared to the old covenant. Yeah. No, I yeah. see that in dispensationalism. Yeah, the church yeah. is this weird parenthesis afterthought thing. Mm -hmm. And Israel is the main story. Yes. <laughs> we're and, sort of and sneaking we're, in the side door. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're the guests sneaking in the side door to the main show or something like that. There's almost a weird sort of Christian inferiority in there. And I honestly think that's part of the reason why a lot of them end up becoming Noahides or not a lot. Who knows how I'm not, it's yeah. unclear to me what that number is, but yeah. that some amount of people from a dispensationalist yeah. background could be like, well, wait a minute. If I'm, if I'm, if I've got the second rate covenant, but the first rate covenant has a path available to me, why wouldn't I just go straight to the first rate covenant? I, I do yeah. think that there is a weird sort of Christian inferiority complex in dispensationalism. Yeah. Or, or I think probably some of them probably go the Hebrew roots route too, and mm -hmm. you know try and assimilate the two, sort of in reaction, you know, yeah. to them having been completely severed. They try to smush them both together. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but it, some of your arguments, I'm certainly not calling you a dispensationalist. I know that you're not a dispensationalist, <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm hearing echoes of some of these dispensationalists that are that want to, at least in the similarity of wanting to emphasize continuity and not liking sort of my more stark kind of dualism between the covenants. <laughs> well, okay, I get called yeah. all kinds of things. I've been called <laughs> an anti-Semite and a Judaizer the same day. So, yeah, well, okay. fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Were you talking about Martin Luther? <laughs> no, I wasn't at the time. Either. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's maybe transition to talking about Athanasius and icons. So yeah. we we mentioned beforehand, sometimes you bring me up nicely, uh, <laughs> so, such as uh, calling me your friend to Gavin Ortland, And I appreciate that because I want to be a thorn in Gavin Ortland's side until he can't ignore <laughs> me anymore. So all the people that bring them up, uh, the better. I hear that Gavin's going to be talking with our friend uh, Dominic Vanderclay soon. And so uh, okay. I'm sure that we'll get some more thorn inside moments from that. But <laughs> um, one of the times that you brought me up was on Lord of Spirits. Again, you brought me up as, uh, I'm not sure if you called me your biblical. You've brought me up, I've heard, I think I've heard myself two or three times in various yeah. Lord of Spirits offhand no, this This time you're talking about, I just said someone said. Someone said. Yes. So the Someone more critical I'm going to be, background. Yes. the more critical I'm going to be, the more vague I am. All right, fair Unless enough. Unless you're fair William enough. Lane Craig or David <laughs> Bentley Hart, in which case, <laughs> in which I just case call you're... you out by name. But other yeah, than those two, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> or a, or a German philosopher. Well, even then, I just say our 19th century German <laughs> friends. Right, it's a, it's a catch-all. Right. Yeah, so, fair enough. Yeah, you have um, to have three initials that you go by. I think is the key for yeah. me to call <laughs> you out by name. And I don't know your middle initials. So. Uh, well, that, that my well, I mean, you know, I, if I'm in for a penny, I'm in for a pound. But my name is Samuel Adams Tiedemann. It's actually very oh, it is. So remember. that was your middle name. Okay. Yes. Oh, so when I used to go by Sam Adams as like yeah. a pseudonym, yeah. 
that yeah. that was only half a pseudonym. Adams is yeah. actually my my birth certificate middle name. Yeah. Okay. So, but uh, referring to you as SAT would be weird. Like, people yes. wouldn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm often confused with a college entrance exam. Yeah. Um, but all right, so we we in, in that clip we talked about, or I was uh, in my um, church father series. I said, hey, you know, Athanasius kind of reads like an iconoclast to me, um, and and I think you heard me as making. Kind, basically a, a rather simplistic argument from silence. And I feel like I was making a slightly more sophisticated <laughs> argument than a purely argument from silence sort of thing. Cause I could say, Hey, Athanasius never mentions the Holy spirit in the incarnation. So therefore he's not a Trinitarian or something like that. Right, um, yeah, and no. that would be a silly thing to say. Although Athanasius doesn't talk about the Holy spirit very much. <laughs> that is true. But in any case, um, I, I was making in, more in the than... extant works of his that we have. We always have to well, the, specify that too. Actually, in the later works, he does. Once the Holy Spirit comes becomes the topic du jour, uh, kind of in the three fifties, um, then he actually does spend quite a time yeah. uh, detailing with the Holy Spirit. But early Athanasius, yeah. strangely absent, I would say, uh, <laughs> suspiciously absent, I might say. But that, of course, I would never argue that he didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, um, but my argument was more that he was criticizing pagan iconography in a way that would seemingly kind of cut too close to the chest if he were, in fact, a person, a Christian who practiced iconography and veneration of icons. It would be like, e you're going to start to feel the heat of your own argument right? It, Whereas, if you keep going yeah. that far. Right. So... And I certainly don't blame you for the, the clip you played when you responded because, like, I do not expect you to play six hours of Lord of Spirits, like, in yes. its entirety, right, for our whole argument, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. like, you get an angry letter from Ancient Faith about reposting <laughs> that much of their content, for one thing. Yeah. Um, and no one would sit through it again. But <laughs> um, so... Another reason I didn't mention your name is it was not about like, here is where I refute Sam, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I was kind of using that, the way you had structured that comment, right? In that, right, he's very critical of idolatry. He never sort of goes back to, well, but here's Christian iconography and that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. and differentiating, right? as a takeoff point for what we were doing across two episodes, right? Which again, okay. I don't blame you for not trying to summarize the whole two episodes or anything. I did listen to but, all two episodes, yeah. I will say. So, and so sort of the argument was, so what I was trying to say about your argument was that I felt like it was based on a certain presupposition and that presupposition is what we were after. Mm -hmm. The presupposition in question being that idolatry and iconography are two instances of the same phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Whereas we were, I was wanting to argue they're two different phenomena with some yeah. similarities. Yeah, right? that makes sense. And I, I suspected that that was part of the point and probably I should have said that, but that does make sense. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, that's what I was really after, not just after you, but I just thought mm -hmm. that that statement was a helpful example of a statement that treated them as. Yeah. There's one phenomenon in two instances, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I see that point. Yeah. So, uh, and and that's in those episodes, we tried to say, okay, look, here's here's idolatry, <laughs> right? Here's how pagan idolatry worked. Here's where we see like idolatry in Israel in the Old Testament, and then here's how idolatry is talked about. For example, in the New Testament, where Saint Paul says covetousness is idolatry, right? And that mm -hmm, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then in the iconography episode, we we try to talk about, well, here's, there, there was also pagan iconography, right? There are pagan idols, right? And there's yeah. pagan iconography and those things serve different purposes. And there yeah. was iconography in the tabernacle and the temple, right? And early synagogues. And then here's iconography sort of in the church. And so uh, when I watched your response, um, so I, to me, based on my view of that, those being separate phenomena. So, for example, most of the quotes that you posted from St. Athanasius, he was specifically talking about idolatry and critiquing it in attempting to portray the divine 
in human and animal forms primarily. Yes. Human or or any, form. any created form. Yeah. Right. Any created yeah. form. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. And I would say Orthodox iconography does not do that. Yes. Right. We don't portray the divine. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, we don't portray but God then, the divine. Right. But I felt like what was interesting is he goes through, I think like two or three, maybe even four different pagan defenses of yeah. idols. And by it, he's like starting with the easiest one to knock down and then progressively going through the more and more sophisticated right. uh, responses, sort of like, okay, here's their opening statement. Here's my opening rebuttal. All right. Here's their slightly more sophisticated statement, more sophisticated rebuttal, final statement, my final rebuttal, something like that, as I yeah. felt like the format of that. And I think by the end, the, the, the pagan that he's sort of, you know, giving voice to is making something that looks like an iconography idolatry distinction where they're saying these ones aren't actually of the high God. These ones are of angels and seemingly intermediary beings, which therefore one could theoretically depict, even if we grant you Athanasius, yes, that most high God is not an alligator that we are, we are agreeing that you, we can't depict highest level divinity. But these ones are of intermediary divinities. And Athanasius uses the word angels, not even like gods yeah. in a lowercase g. He says that right. they're the pagans are calling them angels, and Athanasius is referring to them as right. angels. Messengers of the gods. Yeah. yeah. Right. Just messenger beings. And, right. and then he still calls it, he's I, I, like his argument is seemingly a little bit like you're still giving them too much attention or, or something along well, those lines. I, that's not how I read his argument. Okay. I, I read his argument as being, well, okay, but those are messengers of divinity, meaning they're still a portrayal, maybe one additional step to remove, mm -hmm. right? You're making a, a, an image of a representation of <laughs> right, divinity rather than divinity itself, right? And that doesn't really solve the problem. But again, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't see Christian iconography as doing that. Right, so if I have an icon of Saint Paul, that that's an icon of Saint Paul. It, it's a portrait of Saint Paul, right? <laughs> like that's. But what of, what about an icon of Jesus? Well, Jesus is human. Yes. Right, and so the first canon from a, a, a council that uh, applies to iconography, even though it's rejected by the West, and so this is a difference. Mm -hmm is in the Quinisex Council, there's a canon that says Jesus, right, Christ, can only be depicted as Jesus. No mm -hmm. lambs, right? So no animals, no lions of the tribe of Judah. He can or only be, be depicted <laughs> as the person, <laughs> right, Jesus of Nazareth. What, what um, year about is that council? Quintessex Council, well, it's called the Quintessex Council because, or the Council in Trullo is between the 5th and the 6th mm -hmm. because the 5th Ecumenical Council didn't issue any canons, any disciplinary or administrative canons. So it's around, I think, 583. Mm -hmm. And it's ecumenical in the East and not in the West. So that's why in Western churches, you'll see like the lamb with the victory banner and stuff. Yeah. I, even Whereas, in Protestant churches, I've seen yeah. that are, yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that becomes a Western traditional image, but it's disallowed yeah. in the East, right? You could only portray Jesus. And to me, like that canon seems to be using St. Athanasius's argument, mm -hmm. right? Because we believe Christ is divine. You can't depict him as these, <laughs> right? Other Created things. forms. You yeah. have to depict him as him. And there's also a rule of iconography, you're not to depict God the Father, and you're only allowed to depict the Holy Spirit as he manifested himself in the context in which he manifested himself. So he could be portrayed as a dove if you're doing an icon of Christ's baptism. But no other time. But yeah. you can't just do a picture of a bird, right? Yeah. So you can't have a picture of the Virgin Mary getting a crown placed on her head, and you've got an old guy on one side, a <laughs> yeah, younger no. guy on the other side, no. and a, a, a dove right above her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. not in the East. Um, mm -hmm. And and like in the Pentecost icon, you could have show the tongues of fire, 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So in the actual context of the manifestation, right? But that's it. Yeah. Right. So what what do you think that those strictures are coming from? Like what sort of the theology or the reasoning behind those um, restrictions? Well, I think it's the reasoning St. Athanasius sets out, right? That you're trying to depict the divine in a way in which he has not revealed himself. Mm -hmm. And therefore it's the subject of human imagination, right? And you're doing the same thing as when Aaron made the golden calf and said, you know, behold your God who brought you out of Egypt right um you're you're trying to fundamentally upend the relationship between humanity and god yeah right and then once you have an idol you can then i mean really the pagan idolatry it was used like a lever <laughs> right it was you now go and serve it take care of it and now there's this quid pro quo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right relationship and stuff right and so to me, Orthodox iconography, when you have those strictures in place. So the history of iconography in the West, the West like accepted, then rejected, then accepted with qualifications, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And and now uh, it seems like there are no rules. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's what comes out of the Frankish councils mm -hmm. that that I came up in my discussion with, with uh, Dr. Ortland. You know, where he's saying, well, these were sort of, I'm like, I don't know if you want to go with those, right? <laughs> like, um, because they said things. So one of one of the things that was said at the Seventh Ecumenical Council that the West had a real problem with was that the Eucharist is not an icon. Mm -hmm. That that's the wrong category to think about it in. Right. And the Frankish Council doubled down on that and said, the Eucharist is the only true icon because to be a true icon, something has to be homo usios with <laughs> right, the object of the symbol. And that's why you can get Eucharistic adoration and stuff right. like that. And, and then yeah. Eucharistic adoration emerges out of that. But uh, so the, the, the second wave of the reason that the Council of Nicaea II had said that was that that was one of the iconoclast arguments. Mm-hmm. Was that it has to be homo usios, right? A portrait of Christ is not homo usios with Christ, therefore it's right, not valid. The Frankish councils took that the other way, right? That that that's the only real icon. Therefore, all this other stuff is sort of adiaphora, right? It's like <laughs> it different, it's you know, not important at all. So you can do 3D statuary, you can do portraits, you can use your imagination, you can depict an old man jesus and a bird right mm -hmm. you could right however it could have maybe been an amazonian tribal you know wooden thingy right that, yeah that yeah. <laughs> yeah and so it becomes very anything goes because it's yeah. sort of not real mm -hmm. <laughs> right um whereas in the east we've got this sense that no this is a very real thing there is a very real connection between the image and its prototype and therefore, it's not indifferent, and therefore, it has to be governed by <laughs> right these stricter sayings and strict rules. You could have a heretical image in the East, right? Um, mm. And so, you end up with a very different kind of understanding based on that. Yeah. So, a, a hypothesis that I kind of have, because, like, honestly, at the end of the day, I'm not entirely sure what my icon theology totally is because if i'm honest and i think i kind of said this in the video like when i'm reading some of these church fathers there's part of me that's like huh i think a lot of them are iconoclasts but then i'm like honestly they would they're probably more severely iconoclastic than i am uh like when i'm reading you know clement of alexandria getting mad at women for looking in the mirror as a way of breaking you know the Ten Commandments by creating an image of themselves while they're putting on their makeup. Yes, he's mad about them putting on makeup, but he was all, he also does quote the commandment against not yeah. making a graven image about not looking in the mirror. And like that's just that's what Platonism like, does to you, though. Yeah, Platonism <laughs> will do that to you, but I do get this general flavor, like that. Like I, as I said in the video, that's sort of like a memorable, uh, poignant example. But I don't think that's unique 
in basically what I would say from like the Justin Martyr through, I don't know, at least the, as, as far as I've gotten up to in the church fathers in the fourth century, that sort of flavor is pretty common. And I, my general working theory is that when Christianity was in much hotter contact with paganism, that it was pretty severely aniconic and, and like not making and not making images of almost like any kind whatsoever. Like, but there like, were, we know there were archeologically St. Athanasius but, churches is churches all had icons in them. But do the we walls. like wh which ones, like which church has uh, archeological evidence that would go back to say Zero Europos is third century, but isn't that a synagogue? No, there's a synagogue and a church, and they both are covered in iconography. But what century was the were the icons painted? Well, at the latest, the third century. I mean, are you sure? That's like, the I, I thought that that was contested. I'm I, I'm no. sorry, I don't know the details no. of that archaeological expedition. And the catacombs in Rome are second century. Have well, images I, all like, over the place. Like the catacombs. Like okay, yeah, there's like. I know that part of the issue with the icon question is like, okay, here's a church. Maybe it's from the third century, but it was in continuous use for many, many centuries. And so it's like, well, it when was did destroyed they... in the third century. That's why Duria so you're Europos saying so important. Duria Europos was destroyed in the third century and had yeah. icons. Yeah. And both see, the synagogue like... and the church. And first century synagogues in Galilee were covered with iconography. We've got a number and... of them. And like, I, I'd be willing to say, and maybe even bet, that Christianity, at least early Christianity common form, was perhaps more aniconic than some forms of Judaism. I, I don't in, understand why that would be. And my, my, contest, my contestation would be that because Christianity had people coming from paganism in, at least at a much higher rate than Judaism did. I'll acknowledge some amount of co uh, pagan converts to Judaism, but for Christianity, it was yeah, the main piles. source. Of yeah. 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 <laughs> that there was a need for greater distinction on the image making question. And that I think that it's not an accident that a lot of the evidence for uh, archeological and textual and whatever for iconography. And then the debates around iconography creep up say i think mostly starting in the fifth and then into the sixth centuries is when the action around icons seems to get hot is that the reason why iconography picks up again is because strangely paganism is now absent and that the need for the sort of firewall distinction between you used to be a pagan you used to venerate icons you used to have idols like that was a huge part of your world. You're now coming into our world and we're going to catechesis the heck out of your image stuff. And we're going to be super aniconic. I think that that was a stronger pressure, ironically, when Christianity was surrounded by paganism and that the, the iconography then ramps up in the absence of paganism. Which is sort of the opposite argument that I think many people make. Like, oh, you got those icons. Say, I, don't, I don't know of anybody who takes that. Even Dr. Ortland now admits that the churches all had iconography. He just wants to argue about veneration. And I like I see so many comments in the church fathers that are along the lines of that Clement of Alexandria well, one. But who's a or, church father? Clement of Alexandria is not a saint. He's a Platonist. Okay, but Irenaeus. Or is a heretic. Yeah, but like, but they but they weren't in their own day. They weren't in their own day. They were extremely yeah, they important. Were. They, yeah. they, they, or in the sense that they were not teaching what mainstream Christianity both, was teaching at that time. I thought that Clement and Origen were both the headmasters of the catechesis school in Alexandria. In Alexandria. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that was like the biggest that, that was and the largest. In the Christian third century, Alexandria is full of Gnostic texts. There was mm -hmm. not this. This is why uh, Alexander and then Athanasius got into so much trouble. Is that when they came to the episcopal throne, they were trying to lock down, right? So you get Saint Athanasius's Paschal letter saying, "These are the only books I want you reading in the churches." Right? That gives us that mm -hmm. earliest mm -hmm. canon list that has the 
mm-hmm. 27 books of the New Testament because they were reading all kinds of other stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, <laughs> the you know, all the yeah. stuff in the, the Nag Hammadi jar and stuff. Yeah. Like that. So yeah. they were there was a massive crackdown. It wasn't just on Arius and the Arians. I mean, it was on all kinds of different groups and movements. And and as you get later into the but, fourth at the beginning of the fifth century, they start going after Origen long before he was condemned by a council. Right. And I mean, Origen did get kicked yeah. out of Alexandria by his bishop yeah. and then goes to the Caesarean bishop. Yeah. Um, yeah. Caesarean, so, not Caesarean. But, 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 but my point. But, <laughs> Those my two point words, once being, upon a time, were the same word. Anyway, yeah. sorry. <laughs> but my point, my point just being that, that I think platonic metaphysics, again, right? Like it's obvious why they would be aniconic. Yes. Right. Any material representation of something is, you know, a shadow cast by an image, cast by, right? Yes. Um, and, and why and, they would, you know, have an anti-material kind of. Yes. Yes, I agree with that. Like I, Oregon and someone like coming about there, but I don't think that was most of Christianity. And I, I mean, you like, know. like I, I quote Irenaeus too. He seems pretty aghast at these or scandalized by these Gnostic Christians who have an yeah. image of Jesus and venerate it after the There's some good articles pagan. about that. There's some good articles about that. Like, talking like, about the difference between what he's saying about that group and the context of that group and iconography in general. But he never makes any, again, like I know that this is an argument from silence, but arguments from yeah. silence, I am a statistician and statisticians <laughs> do appreciate Arguments from silence are grow in weight the longer the silence is. Uh, and the 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 bigger the stack of silence, the stronger an argument from silence is. Uh so like but you know, I, I go I ahead. I think that works the opposite way. Because the way the church fathers write, they don't write about things until it becomes an issue, like you were talking about with St. Athanasius. He doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit much until that becomes the hot issue, and then he starts writing about the Holy Spirit. That doesn't but mean he you, didn't believe in the Holy Spirit earlier mm-hmm. or he's developing all new beliefs. It's just he, he didn't write about it until it it became and an there, issue. There's right. certainly truth about that and that relevance and controversy and those sorts of things play a huge role in what you're going to write about. And that's where I see icons start getting written about a lot in, say, late 400s, 500s, and 600s. Right. And that's when it seems to become contentious. And as far as I can tell, the people writing against the icons are writing just as early as the people writing for the icons. And there's tons of people who are like, where are all these icons coming from? We've never had icons. What's what's that? What's up with this? But you know, so there there's just seemingly as much newness and surprise from the iconoclasts yeah. uh, as as there is uh, from seemingly the opposite direction. And so it does become an issue. So it is interesting right. to think about. But so many of these anti-Nicene fathers are writing apologetic works where they're interacting with pagan, both idolatry and seemingly iconography, too. And they never seemingly bring up, and I do think that this is a relevant point, that they do bring up the topic of images and idols and icons and never talk about a Christian positive alternative. Like, as far as I know, I don't think there is a single positive mention of Christian icons in, like, any of the anti-Nicene fathers, like, period. Um, well, it's, from... it's, there, there are some. There are some people have been, uh, you know, this isn't my field, right? But the there are some. But to me, that's, again, if these are two separate phenomena, right? If it's not linked in the mind of the writer, they wouldn't yeah. necessarily think to bring so it up. That's now why the now you've I got gave. a dualism where I see a continuity. Right. I see yeah. a, a relative <laughs> continuity between iconography right. and idolatry. And yes, right. I can admit, I can agree with a spectrum. And there's a difference between thinking it's a god and thinking it's an angel. There's a difference between offering it a sacrifice and not offering it a sacrifice. And there's an inter- a difference between it being a mural on the wall for decoration and it being uh, used in a sacred iconographic interactive context. There are, I, I, I acknowledge a spectrum yeah. and a difference, but I, I see it as a spectrum and you're making a dualism, which is, as right. I mentioned, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. And so, so to me, rather than it being the demise of paganism, see, I see it as by the time you get into the fifth and sixth centuries 
and then in the seventh century, um, you have a Judaism that has become aniconic, largely in reaction to Christianity. And I could believe that. Right. I, like, They've gotten rid of all the imagery and mm -hmm. are, are issuing polemics against Christianity about it. Right. So you yeah. find things even in the Talmud talking about kissing idols. Pagans didn't go and kiss the idols in the temples. They're talking about Christians. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> That's, um, and then, of course, you have the rise of Islam, which is completely right. Right. And, 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 so, and one could wonder where where Islam got its aniconism from. And yeah, which is I, interesting because the Church of the East at that point had icons. Right. And did it? I mean, yes. so like another yeah. I mean, another person that I can think of that talks vehemently against icons and images and never offers a Christian alternative is Afrahat. But he's he's like three forties. And so that's a yeah. couple hundred years before. No, they, so they I, did. I mean, they got yeah, rid of I, them later. They went through an iconoclastic phase in the 16th century. The so the, whole the Assyrian Church of the East, I would, because yes. I've seen some Assyrian churches of the East, and they don't tend to have icons right. in them. Right, that and so that much so later, and that was history. perhaps a reaction to Islamic persecution. I could Maybe. like, I yeah. I could believe Maybe. that that they it was a way of do dodging or complying with some law in yeah. you know some Muslim empire or something like that, and yeah. then they kept it. I could like. I can totally believe a story where a Syrian church of the East goes from having icons to not having icons because of some political pressure related to Islam. And yeah. that, then, and that, and then that's still around. I've actually yeah. offered, I think that many Protestants might find the Assyrian church of the East, a easier pill to swallow in some ways. Oh, than yeah. some other no, Orthodox really. churches. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. they don't call Mary the mother of God. <laughs> yeah. So that Nestorian thing going on. And um, and they don't have images. So it's like of those uh, of people converting to Orthodoxy or Catholicism from a Protestant background, those are often two of the biggest things. And they yeah. seem to de-emphasize that. So but anyway, I, I've, I've pointed that out before. That I'll true. point it out again. But yeah. I, I do think when I'm looking at it, like Clement and Origen, call them heretics later <laughs> on. But I don't think that they were unrepresentative. And oh, I don't I, think I that, do see that's the difference. And I, to I me, like, like that was the thing when I was talking to Dr. Ortland. You come to me and your quotations are from Eusebius of Caesarea, Origen, and Clement of Alexandria. And I'm like, this would be like I came to you and said, okay, let me give you some Protestant beliefs that I quoted like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. I right? haven't you would me be a lot. Like, no. That those are not mainstream. <laughs> So but to me, they're just, a, I, I can be like, right. one side thinks they're heretic, the other side doesn't, like, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. they're both yeah. as wrong yeah. from my perspective, and they, they're both equally as plausible and strong and representative historical examples of Christianity at the time as any of the other people that we have. Uh, right, right. And that's a different and, perspective, right? So yes. To me, well, but part of that is because, to me, the argument is not what were some people who called themselves Christians doing, right? Because if we're going to do that, we got to throw in the Gnostics. Mm. We got to throw it right, like you know, all kinds of things. It's what was you know our understanding of apostolic succession, right? These historic communities that had passed out traditions. What were they doing mm -hmm. at that time in history? And yes, and, there were the centers. I mean, I could throw time. I could throw Tertullian into the mix too. I know he has the exact same exactly. problem, exactly, but. Well, it's not exactly the same problem because Tertullian also did not like Platonic philosophy, even though he no. probably has he probably has more of it than he likes to think he does. But he thinks that he does not like Platonic philosophy. Yeah. But he and became he's a way over, right? But he's way over in Carthage. He's not in you know that's yeah. it's a it's the Latin environment. It's a very different cultural milieu milieu than Alexandria yeah. at the time. But so my thing is that when you see and like I still think Irenaeus is a pretty strong example. So he's like from, you know, Smyrna and then in France and you've got Tertullian in Carthage and you've got the Alexandrian crew all saying very similar things that it seems to suggest a shared root of a tradition of Christianity being like like I would say shockingly hard nosed iconoclasts against right. like images or pictures of almost any kind of anything. And I think yeah. another part of it is like they don't have big buildings yet at this time. 
is another distinction between Christianity and Judaism. Judaism has established synagogues and, and you know, big sort of buildings in the public square, and Judaism is under less persecutorial heat than Christianity is for much of the Roman most period. Most of the time. Yeah, most, most of the time. time. There, there are counterexamples, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and, and Christians can't build a big building in the public square yet. They're still mostly meeting in houses or perhaps some larger buildings, but oftentimes the, that building might have a, a different purpose during the week or something like that. So that they don't have time, energy, or resources to invest in much decoration. And that I think that's another complement to the idea of them being very aniconic is this strong need to differentiate from paganism, especially when they're catechizing all these pagan converts, and sort of the impracticalities of the situation also kind of complementing that. Yes, I think you're right that pagan, uh, that, sorry, Platonic philosophy is an ingredient in the story. Fully admit that. But I don't think it's the only ingredient. Because like when right. when Clement's talking about not liking women who look in the mirror, first thing he does is quote Deuteronomy. Second thing he does is give a platonic argument. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, you know, so and obviously Judaism has its aniconic spectrum as well. And we could argue right. about, you know, I, I think you and I would agree that sometimes Judaism can be very hard edged and iconic. And there might have been times where they were not even OK with decorations and synagogues or that might have been a contention between different schools of thought and stuff like that. Yeah. Mostly a reaction to Christianity. But going back to those figures. Right. It's not just like, oh, they're a heretic, so they don't count. It's part of what we mean by heretic is they're a dissenter. On a whole bunch of issues. Right. So Tertullian leaves sort of the general Christian church to join a group that thought that the prophet Montanus was the comforter promised by Jesus. Okay. <laughs> so I, I have some sympathy for the Montanus as a charismatic person. I, know, right, I, I find some of them. I wouldn't claim them too quickly. <laughs> yeah. I know that some of them, yeah. you know, uh, they were I, very, they were very much like a lot of modern cults. Montanus traveled around with two female <laughs> prophetesses. They lived together. There were lots of things going on. Careful but, though, make insinuations. I'm sure that are right. extremely <laughs> reputable, you know, until but, there's hard evidence. But so clearly on a whole bunch of points of theology, Tertullian is dissenting from the mainstream of Christianity. Right. So but the icon thing doesn't seem to be something well, that changes his mind. How do you know? How do you know? Well, right? he, because well, he, he'll talk about Eusebius is a dissenter, right? So when, when I look at the list. Well, Eusebius people, wasn't, uh, wasn't considered unorthodox in his day. Well, he, I mean, well, he well, was condemned at. I mean, he was condemned at a church council or two, but who wasn't, right? You know, every important he church figure in the fourth. He was a semi-Arian. But, but for most of his life, semi-Arianism was ascendant and powerful, right? And that doesn't mean it's not a... So, so this but, is the but, thing. I, Dissension he, does he, not mean numbers, right? Right. So we don't judge but, the but theology he was, of the church by democracy. But, the Arians but were in he, the majority. St. Athanasius was still right, and the Arians were dissenters in our view. But but Eusebius, while I think he was condemned at one council in 322, right before the Council of Nicaea, but that was organized by Marcellus of Ancyra, um, he was condemned at that council, but then, you know, uh, Constantine invites him to give the right. keynote address at the he beginning the of the Council of, of Nicaea. He spent right. the rest of his life kissing... St. Constantine's rear end. Yeah, and yeah. that's why he was And, and he was he saint. continued to be the bishop of, of Caesarea. Right. And so I, I don't think he's and, not a saint like, because his, his view of the Trinity is wrong from the perspective of us. Yeah, but that was decided after his lifetime. He wasn't a dissenter during his day. He had his political confrontations, like, but he was excommunicated right. fewer but, times than most saints. But he, so, but to me, he was not like, a dissenter right. in his own day. And but, I don't but, think he was unique on the icons. I could give you a whole list. Right. But that's you don't think he was unique on the icons. <laughs> but we never hear anyone argue against him on icons. It's not like the pro Nicenes were pro icons. Because it wasn't a major the, debate. He right, also because I don't think Revelation. anyone really disagreed with him. Who, who disagreed with him about the book of Revelation directly said Eusebius is wrong about the book of Revelation. I can imagine a bunch of people, but I, I guess I don't know their names. But I think there that... aren't any in writing who directly addressed it. And I could give you a list, including Eusebius, of all the church fathers who didn't think Revelation was canonical. Mm -hmm. Right. I would still say, from our perspective, 
that, that because that is an incorrect view of the canon, I would categorize them as dissenters, right? And so, again, when you have a figure who I would say is wrong about A, B, C, D, E, F, and then you quote him about G, that's why I'm saying that doesn't carry a lot of weight with me. All right, yeah. but then here's an argument that I could give and counter back to that. So let's imagine that the dissenters are aniconic and the non-dissenters are pro-icons. Seemingly, that would be then a thing that we would expect them to argue about when, you know, Tertullian is criticizing, he criticizes the, the Pope. You know, he, uh, Tertullian has a candidate for being the first Protestant because he thinks that the Pope has become, yeah. the Bishop has, of Rome has become an antichrist. <laughs> so he's the first person with that idea. And he criticizes them mostly on rejecting the, the new prophecy, like you mentioned from Manus and his um, uh, predecessors, uh, successors. Um, and he criticizes them on, I think, uh, believing in remarriage. And he criticizes them perhaps just on not taking virginity seriously enough because the Montanists really took that virginity yeah. thing quite seriously. Right. So we, we have a list of things that he's more than happy to talk about what he believes in contrast to the Bishop of Rome and what the Bishop of Rome is currently teaching. Not on that list is iconography, even though he has a whole book about images and idols, but he only criticizes pagans in that in contrast to the Christians, but we never see him, it's a dog that isn't barking, him criticizing the pro-icon Christians. Right. And well, so- You're assuming they thought that was of equal importance. Well, I mean, from my perspective, one would expect maybe someone to mention it sometime. Right. Like if you've got who God is wrong or who Jesus is wrong, or right? Like the fact that you don't like icons is kind of way down the list. Well, it's interesting. That's another right. thing that Tertullian never right. criticizes the Bishop of Rome about is Christology. That, you know, for the record, right? Even but I mean, he my, criticizes being, plenty of other right. people. Like you're assuming that you know, the fact that something's low on the list, and so we don't, and that you know, we're dealing with a paucity of what has survived to this day of all the writings from the ancient world. But, I, yeah. but again, I think Mr. if there Mark were pro. Way. <laughs> I, I still think, like, if there's pro-icon Christians at some point and anti-icon Christians at some point, and they're contemporaneous in the anti-Nicene period, I think we would expect them to argue about that because they argue about it later when there are clearly pro-icon and anti-icon groups in, you know, the iconoclastic periods. Right, but at that phase, you have an iconoclastic emperor who's going out and actively destroying icons and killing people and torturing people and imprisoning people for yeah, hiding icons. Branded, so that fully, makes it a huge branded. issue. If it's just like, hey, you know, my church has tons of art in it and yours has less or yours has not much at all, especially when you're under persecution. But like I'm that, like and I'm you're saying, arguing about the Trinity, that seems like a much smaller issue to me. But it, these people seem to have had very strong opinions on the issue. Like Tertullian's whole book against idols is like, again, it's even more thorough than my sort of Athanasius argument, because he goes even into more detail about all the reasons he doesn't like icons and idols and images and idolatry yeah. and all that, because he has a full book on the subject, whereas Athanasius mostly deals with it in, say, like five paragraphs. And so, and like I said, Clement clearly had strong, uh, Clement of Alexandria clearly had strong opinions on the issue. So if we think that they have strong opinions on the issue, and that there are supposed to be other Christians somewhere that they could theoretically know about that would be doing something that they had strong opinions against. It's, it would be weird to not see anything. Again, an argument from silence, but yeah. I, I mean... I, from a lack of... I mean, there may be stuff we have that's not even translated yet that deals with this. Fair enough. Also true. Right. Right. And I mean, I, I just... I, I, I don't think the archaeological case is there that there wasn't iconography. Right. I was unaware of me, his, the... his argument from silence is a little stronger because, yeah, I mean, how could I prove that someone was kissing them? Mm. Right. Well, so I, <laughs> and again, I actually, yeah. I, I, I think, well, I would need to look at the archaeological evidence a little bit harder because honestly, I was yeah. unaware that there was any hard physical evidence of icons from, say, any earlier than like the fifth or sixth century. Yeah. Um, well, that's the argument Calvin made. But there, there is now, 
in the catacombs and in during Europos. And so there, there is now hard of, and again, the Jewish, right. The prevalence of Jewish iconography up to and including during Europos, right. In the first century, we know in the third century, we know. Um, and I think most Jewish scholars will agree that Judaism became a, as an iconic as it is in reaction to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, it's, it's also sort of, that almost kind of points in favor of the point that I was making. When you're a religious minority, the views and practices of your majority context can have a powerful shaping effect on your theology and as a need to distinguish yourself. And that, as best as I can tell, I do think that that's one of my arguments why I think Christianity was more an iconic in its pagan context than it was absent the pagan context is as an identity marker. Part, part of it, too, depends on how old you think the doctrine of the incarnation is, which may be an underlying issue here between us, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, because but that's what the I mean, Council of Nicaea is about. It's not really about iconography. It's about the incarnation. It's about, I, I would say the Council of Nicaea is about the relationship of the Father to the, and the Son no, I mean, to Nicaea the incarnate. Nicaea, Nicaea too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not really about iconography. It's about the incarnation. Mm -hmm. And I would because say, I think so. Justin Martyr is a clear attestation of the belief in the incarnation of some kind. I mean, obviously, yeah. I think he was. I don't think he's, I don't think he's an iconic. I don't think say Justin Martyr is an iconoclast. Well, I mean, he does. He he doesn't talk about the subject as much, nearly as as much as some of the other people. But he has some of the usual stock and standard criticisms of pagan idolatry in right. his apologies. But he, I, I wouldn't use him. I wouldn't be able to use him as strongly as I could some of the other authors. But as far as I can tell, he has a similar yeah. kind of. General. But I mean, the, the Jews who were worshiping in those synagogues that were covered in iconography had a strong polemic against pagan idolatry. And it would be, that would be an right? interesting I mean, that's, thing. You know, well, it would be an interesting thing to hear if they made those same kind of arguments unembarrassed and didn't distinguish. That would be a helpful point in your favor, I think. Is if we knew Jews from that context that weren't like the aniconic rabbinic Jews or something like that. Yeah. Well, the apostles. We have the synagogues they went to, the synagogues Christ preached in. They had iconography. They had zodiac mosaic mosaics in the entryways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? but, With the again, pictures of the chariot of the sun in them. <laughs> right? That's, and Jesus walked in there and preached. Yeah, The apostles condemn idolatry all the time. The Galilean ones, St. Peter, right? And seem unapologetic about what the synagogues looked like that they worshipped in. That's a powerful point. I think then that would force something more like a Gavin Ortland style distinction that, and yeah. like, I, I think I have said this other places, like I've been to Baptist churches that are about as aniconic as you can think of, but then you go to the children's nursery and they have a picture of Noah on an ark with a bunch of animals. Yeah. If you said, why do you have an icon of Noah? They'd be like, shut up. That's just a children's decoration yeah. for the nursery. Kids like animals. Yeah. We teach kids about the children's stories because they like animals. Like, yeah. don't. The good old flanograph. Know. Yeah. With right. all the. Yeah. <laughs> you may be too young to remember the flannel graph, but. I don't know what that is, but. Oh, yeah. There's a bunch of Gen X and older people who are giving the thumbs up. It was this kind of felt board thing where you'd have these cut out felt shapes of like biblical characters that would kind of stick to it. And mm -hmm. so you kind of tell Bible stories for little kids and stick the, <laughs> the characters on there. So I have a question. Why do you think that there was an aniconic flair in the uh, iconoclastic controversies, say in like the five or 600s? I, I think it's due to Judaism and then the beginnings of the rise of Islam, you're getting. But I think some of the first ones are prior to Islam, right? Right, but their their critiques coming from Judaism, which has become an iconic, and is deliberately like in the Talmud calling Christians idolaters, right, and saying that they're violating the commandment. Um, you get in some circle. I mean, anybody who's heavily influenced by Platonism, right? It's kind of incompatible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right 
Um, and uh, then once once you get to the iconoclastic emperors, who are influenced by all kinds of things, right? Um, the, relatively few emperors are saints. Just, just like there, you could count the good kings of Israel like on one hand, right? Like <laughs> that's, um, and it becomes this life or death issue. You know, and I think that's what's behind the anathemas too. For example, we have to give that context, right? If you have people who've been literally being killed over this, and imprisoned and, and tortured and stuff, then yeah, they're going to have some kind of harsh words for the people who did that to them. <laughs> you know, in terms of no. God's justice. You know, um, so yeah, I, I I think that's what it is, and I think the the defenses like from Saint John of Damascus and Saint Theodore of the Stodite of iconography are all centered around the incarnation and the material and the redemption of the material world. And it's really this issue of the incarnation versus kind of a Platonism. Right. But one can believe in the incarnation and be pretty darn platonic also. Uh, well, Justin Mar Clement and uh, Clement of Alexandrian origin also believed in the incarnation. And sort of, <laughs> sort of origin, especially, Origin, I will grant, it has yeah. strong has strong Nestorian tendencies. Yes, yes. I, <laughs> that is yeah. true. I, I'm yeah. less sure of that for Clement, but I would say <laughs> Clement's I mean, a little vaguer. We don't know exactly what he thought out about. It's hard to pin down on mm -hmm. several times. And but I do think that the the Platonism thing that I was talking about. I mean, I think that you can see Athanasius making those same Platonically flavored arguments i and, see i yeah that was a thing i disagreed with in your response i think you're I reading think, it through a platonic grid that uh, yes but i mean he is in alexandria in the 300s which is a very platonic yeah, place so is arius yes but i <laughs> i mean i think that arius was more i i do think that part of the arian controversy is that arius was more loyal to a neoplatonic style i would cascading, agree with that hierarchical triad I agree than, than Athanasius was. But so you can I have will, radical disagreements within Alexandria is all I'm saying. Yes, right? this, yes. This you, you can have, yeah, Alexandria yeah, yeah. Loves, loves arguing about uh, minor distinctions. And, yeah. <laughs> but, and I, I mean, I would say like, it would be hard to find a thinking person that was native to Alexandria in, you know, Athanasius was born in like, you say 290 something, you know, that that's like peak middle, peak Neoplatonism time. In in Alexandria, oh, so yeah. I think projecting but, a, a neo, especially when I was pointing out there are some very strong similarities of theology and language between him and Plotinus. That was part of my point, and that they're only right. forty years apart in the same city. That, but that's I, not I, a that, to me. Well, we'll get to that in a second, right? I think the biggest thing with Saint Athanasius is I think what he says is on the in on the incarnation is not compatible with a Platonic metaphysics. And so I'm not going to read the first volume, the other volume of his work in a way that I think would be incompatible with that one. And maybe that would be like, my pushback on the Platonic. Perhaps reading. maybe the, the most super hard edged form of Platonism. But, the, but, but I, I mean, even Plotinus, a lot of the Arians, yeah. even a lot of the Arians were perfectly fine with incarnational stuff. And sometimes they were often accused of being more. Uh, Miaphysite or Apollinarian than um, properly dual natured -y. Like, you don't see a lot right. of the Arians get accused of separating the natures of Christ too much. If anything, they get accused of doing the opposite, especially like Basil of Caesarea will criticize them for, oh, right. uh, like, when he's criticizing Eunomius, like, he's mostly criticizing his. Christology for not separating the divine and human natures enough. And so I think that an, a, uh, the way that it would work for a pretty Neoplatonic Arian is that you, when, you're, when you make such a strong distinction between the Father and the Son, and you demote the Son's divinity to a lower level of divinity, then it allows a full incarnation of grade B divinity to make more sense, even in a Platonic metaphysic. Right. Right. No, yeah, I agree with that about the, the Arians. But I think it, just history of philosophy wise, right? Plotinus was Christianizing Platonism, not vice versa. 
I and I, I I agree with that. Took I, elements of Christianity brought them into Platonism. So this is this is one of my things with Verbeke, right? He says he walks into a Christian church and says he sees a lot of Neoplatonism there. That would be like me walking into a Orthodox synagogue and saying, "Oh, I see a lot of Orthodox Christianity and, here." And, I, and I've right. pointed that out to Verveke before. I've said to yeah. Verveke, "I've confronted Verveke to his face that hey, the writings Good. of Origin predate the writings of Plotinus." <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. if we're going to compare Origin and Plotinus, then shouldn't we see who is before whom in the sequence? Yeah, and, and so I, I that is I've many that... the genius of Platonism to me is that it can assimilate all these things. Mm -hmm. Right, it can it can kind of glom onto and assimilate things. I think that's part of what what went wrong theologically in the West, right? <laughs> from my perspective. Right, um, is that too much Platonism got in there and glommed it and became controlling in certain areas of theology mm -hmm. rather than the Christian elements becoming controlling. But so to me, if you read Saint Athanasius and see Plotinus, that's because Plotinus was taking things from Alexandrian Christianity. And I think right. I said those are actually Alexandrian video. Christianity things in Athanasius. Yeah, and I think I said that in the video that like I, when I'm when I'm comparing I when I'm bringing in Plotinus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm I'm being careful. I'm not accusing yeah. <laughs> I'm not accusing Athanasius of harping or stealing improperly pagan philosophy. I was more just like bringing up the general Alexandrian mil yeah. milieu. The, yeah, the, and, and and I'm perfectly and, okay with yeah. with. Uh, influence going in multiple directions and all yeah. of that. And, and there's an important word concept thing too, right? In the sense that some of those things that were incorporated, say, by Plotinus, he's using the same Christian terms, but not necessarily to mean the same thing. Sure. That yeah. the Christians meant. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, you find that in Gnosticism and other things too. Like Redeemer can mean a lot of different things. Right. <laughs> right, savior could mean a lot of different things, but uh, even if I like drop Plotinus out of the picture and just focus yeah. on Origen, who's like 60 70 years older than Athanasius, yeah, but yeah, from yeah. the same place, yeah. then that the idea, like, and I and again, I do think right, it's in the paganism and it's in the Christianity, this goal of like this sort of mystical com contemplative practice that seemed to have been a very strong centerpiece of their spirituality where it's seemingly to me like the goal is to almost like leave your body by kind of retreating inward in sort of a mystical way where you're trying to kind of ignore sense and uh, in their, um, you know, metaphysic, uh, like with your soul ascend into the higher realms of the cosmic hierarchy um, through this kind of inward looking thing. Yeah, I would. So... The Eastern Orthodox tradition would strongly dis disagree with that characterization. Um, I there think are figures who are certainly teaching that. Um, uh, and, and a lot of them are around the edges of Christianity, from mm. our perspective. Right? Yeah, but I'm talking if about in say, the two and three hundreds. You know, yeah, before... Evagrius Ponticus. I mean, I'm talking about actual, these actual figures like this, right? Mm. And a lot of those figures were influential on like the desert fathers and stuff. So there, it's no, not that there's no. no influence there. Right. But there are also important discontinuities. Right. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, origin certainly was an influence on St. Athanasius. Right. Yeah. And St. Basil and St. Gregory. Right? And Arius. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. But that shows you how there are also significant discontinuities of each of them with origin. Right. Yes. That would yes. allow them to come to such widely different conclusions. Right. right? And so, um the the what we come to see as the orthodox tradition and yes from someone outside yeah we're it looks like we're arbitrarily picking one thread right? and saying that's the right one right i accept i do the same thing yeah so. yeah <laughs> so um in our tradition but uh our so like for example we just had the sunday of saint gregory palamas right saint gregory palamas critical and fundamental to his argument is that the vision of Christ that is achieved by an ascetic, sort of this highest level of spiritual vision, is a vision of Christ with our physical eyes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And but but Paul Moss is, that's over a thousand years later. So right. I, I, I'll but be perfectly happy. that all on quotes from Basil and quotes mm -hmm. from St. Gregory of Nyssa. And quote, right. So he's not making that up later. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's 
put drawing but, on. He's saying, no, this is the correct thread. And but Balam Athanasius, Origen, and Plotinus all use the phrase "the eye of the soul," right? Oh, yeah, no, In the describing yeah. their mystical, yeah. you know. Well, right. they use the word "noose," but they also use "eye of the yeah. soul." Right. as the way in which you're ascending into the the mystical realm, right. or the the higher realm mystically the question is is there then this cutoff right is there this dualism between that and the physical senses or is that sort of a sixth sense with the physical senses and they're all together mm -hmm. that's yeah. the distinction and barlam of calabria who saint gregory palmas was arguing with when he lost the debates, just went west and became a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. So it's not that he was this weird total fringe figure. He was reflecting the more of the Western Platonic mm -hmm. view of it, yeah. right? Where he said, no, it's the eye of the mind, right? <laughs> it's it's a, it's an in ascent of the intellect, right? Um, and so that that was that's a very real disagreement between what became the mainstream of the Eastern tradition and what became the mainstream of the Western tradition on that subject. Mm -hmm. So it's not that that wasn't there, right? And those figures right. that you're seeing didn't believe, they did, right? It's just that the East did not accept that thread. The West did more. Do you know anything about Oriental Orthodox now in their um, stances on these sorts of questions? So... It's hard to generalize, right? The, the the Oriental Orthodox churches are much more independent mm -hmm. than the Eastern Orthodox churches. Um, so, for example, the Coptic church right now, there's sort of an internal quasi-schism. I mean, nobody is actually schismed, but there is one very significant and numerous party that is often looking for reunification with the Eastern Orthodox that is very much, very similar, very close, right, to our tradition. But there's another very significant and numerous segment that, for example, thinks St. Maximus the Confessor was a heretic. Mm -hmm. and it was rejects, good that his tongue got chopped off. Yeah, rejects the idea of theosis. <laughs> Right, like has a very different view, <laughs> right? Of is is more the view of the incarnation that caused us to split in the first place, <laughs> right. and yeah, and leans yeah. into the meophytism and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and, and emphasizes distinction. Yeah, yeah, and the last two popes of Alexandria have been from either one of those factions, mm -hmm. so that's the level of split that like it's not that one is a minority even. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, like, for us to talk about unity with them, they need to internally unify first, right? Mm -hmm. But there's not that same kind of split among, say, the Armenians, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. the Armenians sort of have their own tradition. And so it's a, it's a very different sort of kettle of fish, depending mm -hmm. on who we're talking about. Like, yeah. the Syriac church is very close to us, but part of that is just... They're operating in Muslim countries. No. And when you're operating under a Muslim majority, the difference between a Syriac Orthodox Church and an Antiochian Orthodox Church and a Melkite Catholic Church becomes more academic when you're all being sort of oppressed, <laughs> right? Yeah. No. No. Um, and so, you know, if, if at some point they were not under that oppression, the differences might become much more significant to them. Who knows, right? Right. Um, and and here in Chicagoland, we have a bunch of Assyrians, and there are some Assyrians that have united with Rome. And yeah, the then Chaldeans, they're, yeah. the yeah, like there's, the, I won't dox my location too close, but within <laughs> not too long of a drive, I could go to a Syrian Catholic church that is in Aramaic and in full communion with Rome. Yeah. Uh, I could also go to one that is absolutely definitely not in communion with Rome and we would never do that. Right. Yeah. And, and well, I mean, the churches that aren't in unity with Rome are the ones who decided to emphasize the distinction, like kind of yeah. by definition, right. It's almost like a Darwinian thing. Yeah. Uh, and so well, that's I, even an interesting case too, because the deal that was made with those churches was you don't have to change anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Basically, pretty, the only pretty. difference is you commemorate the Pope. 
mm-hmm. in your liturgy, but you keep your liturgy. We're not going to go over it, look at the theology of it, just whatever you've been doing, whatever you've been, right? No, <laughs> no. So, yeah, that is a really interesting situation. It's not like Rome sat down with them and said, okay, you need to sign off on the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th ecumenical councils and Vatican II. And, uh, none of that, no. right? It was just, yeah. No. No. What, th- this was down the, the rabbit hole of uh, Neoplatonic mysticism. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and that being connected to the idea that why would you look at a picture down here? That's not going right. to help you get up there. It's sort of right. the general idea. Yeah, that and, there's this radical disconnect. Yeah. Yeah. And so if your goal is to ascend with the eye of your mind to look at the realm of eternal forms, or to ascend up to the Logos and to be with Christ and behold Christ and thereby behold the Father. But you're doing that. You're looking at uncreated light through the light, eye of your mind, etc. And all this stuff down here, it's like, how's that going to help you? If you're looking at that, you're looking down here. The goal is to look up there. Like, And there's such a radical disconnect that you could never draw or engrave anything that could help point you up. And kind of part of my Probably point it would drag you down yeah yeah it would yeah. drag you down and athanasius seems to talk like that and i think that uh, that that, that I don't like think that's see, compatible with his understanding of the incarnation take that he up really with him believe that god became man <laughs> like he really <laughs> believes that <laughs> that's his central thesis right i think i think that in early athanasius there is still more of a distinction between the father and son than most people would think that well, what? trinitarianism doesn't disagree that there's a distinction between the father and the son. right but <laughs> but there there is a, there is still a lever of distinction and or uh, levels of distinction and kind of uh, part of the point that i made in the video is that i think that one of the arguments between the arians and the athanasians or the alexander uh, bishop ians um is the idea of what this mysticism could accomplish and whether it was cataphatic or apophatic. And yeah. that the Arians were basically had a very strong apophatic mysticism, such that the logos, you can get up there, but that won't get you to the highest step because the highest step is so ineffably beyond even the logos or something like that. And so you have to be very apophatic once you get to the logos. And Athanasius being like, no, you know, like when you're beholding the Logos and you're looking at the Son of God, he's such a good representation of the Father, same nature, very God, you know, light of light, et cetera, et cetera, that you do see the Father through him and that there isn't something missing or some incommunicability that is left behind or something like that. And that that being one of like because at some level one has to argue why did they care about this so much <laughs> right that, that that does sort of need an answer and i think if their mystical practice was such an important part of their spirituality and their view of salvation and their view of the point of the christian spiritual life and that there is this apophatic cataphatic distinction in how the the logos can connect to God the Father, that to me starts to connect with something that could seem more like an intelligible motivation for um, why the Aryan controversy would have stirred up strong feelings as opposed to just being a purely propositional abstract thing. Yeah, I, I think the knowledge of God is deeply involved. But I mean, I think in even just how you just described St. Athanasius, right? St. Athanasius would say, not just if you behold the Logos in some spiritual sense, because he doesn't believe the Logos is disembodied, right? He would say, if you're seeing Christ, right? I mean, as, as Christ says in St. John's Gospel, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Why are you saying, right. me, show me the Father, right? So St. Athanasius would have a strong view of that, right? You've seen God if you've seen Jesus, yeah, right. but how do and, we how do we do that now if we're not one of the apostles or if we're not living in Jesus's well, time? iconography. Um, <laughs> right. That's, so I don't. So this is one of the, the things. So say Basil the Great makes this argument regarding the Trinity, 
right? That the, that the reason I think we've talked about this before, actually, that the, the, you know the reason we're monotheists is that the worship that goes to the Son and the Spirit is passed to the Father because it goes from the image to the mm-hmm. right to the prototype, and that of course then also is a principle that we see in the parable of the sheep and the goats, right? This is just basic image of God stuff from Genesis, right? You spills man's blood, his blood will be spilled by man because of the image of God. So whatever you do to your fellow human, you're doing to God by way of doing it to his image, right? That's sort of the negative, right? The parable of the sheep and the goats is the positive and the negative, right? And so I don't understand why that principle about reverence, veneration, respect, disrespect that shown to the image passes to the prototype wouldn't then apply to literal images, right? Why that would only apply to images in this sort of other connected sense and not to, you know, my icon of Christ, right? That me kissing it, right? Or, you know, bowing to greet it wouldn't be me showing respect to the person of Jesus, right? Right. And I think, This is a weird thing that I'm trying to be the one who's um, trying to put on the mindset of Athanasius to argue against you. I don't know how quite we ended up in this particular form of role playing, but I'll I'll keep it up for a second. (laughs) Sam as Athanasius would disagree with you in the sense that I think that for Athanasius, the role of the incarnation is to remind us to look upward. Like we had gotten so stuck looking downward and so, 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 trapped in the realm of sense that we needed a wake-up call and the only wake-up call that would get our attention was something down in the realm of sense and so that the incarnation was necessary to have a messenger from the higher realm come down to the lower realm and say hey stop looking at all this stuff down here keep looking back up here also by the way just so that you can figure out who I am and that I have the authority to tell you these things. Here are these miracles that manifest my identity, uh, my divinity, and here's my rising from the dead, uh, another proof of my deity, and now I'm going to go back up. Also, keep now turn your eyes upwards, please. And yeah. I think that on the incarnation, because it's right after against the heathen, that that's sort of the thrust of it, and that he still imagines that the goal is to do this inward and upward and iconic, you know, removal from the realm of sense and the down here thing. I I radically disagree. I think that's just making St. Athanasius a Gnostic. I I mean, that's literally Gnosticism. (laughs) I I mean, it's it's a little different, but I mean, I, I mean, I, if you want to throw Athanasius under the bus, like, no, I'm saying that's not at all what St. Athanasius believed. I think, think St. Athanasius is saying the incarnation puts an end to idolatry because the person, Jesus Christ, is the express image of God. We no longer need to fantasize or imagine or philosophize or reason and try and represent God because God has represented himself perfectly. Right? That That's how I read it. So I read it the opposite way. Now, I will say, just to be super controversial and get people angry at me, what you just said is actually kind of close to some of the things St. Augustine says about Christology. Um, and that's part of the Platonic influence. But he will say, he says at one point that we should move from the contemplation of Christ's humanity upwards to the contemplation of his divinity. Yeah, Origen right? says which, the exact same thing. Yeah. Which, which sounds quasi Nestorian on top of everything else, right? <laughs> like, yeah. That these are these two separate things and there's this ascent. So I'm, I'm saying that is part of the Platonic Christian tradition that takes hold in the West. But I don't I don't read St. Athanasius as part of that. I read St. Athana- Athanasius and within the Eastern tradition, the way the Cappadocians read him, which is and- that he's actually pitting the incarnation against that. And I think that part of it is that Athanasius was pretty Apollinarian-ish, I think, is part of how this fits together for him. In that he, I don't think he really believed in a human soul in Jesus. And that I think that it was sort of like the Logos was the person. And that he... I like I I don't think I ever encountered and I looked for this any mention of a human soul again argument from uh, uh, silence but sometimes it's the only thing you've got 
And he only ever talks about the body as a body. I, I don't think that he had quite a full Chalcedonian Christology, which is part of what makes his inclination in this direction more plausible to me, is that he really just was taking on the flesh or the body as the Logos mind soul thingy to be the messenger down here to bring us back up there. Yeah. Which I, and yeah, that, I, I don't think he's an Apollinarian. I think the way he's using the word body is an older use of the word body that is closer to how we would later use the term nature. Right. So nature, <laughs> this is part of what leads to the Chalcedonian non Chalcedonian split is that in Alexandria, they use the word nature more in its classical philosophical form, like its Aristotelian meaning. But, but was, origin and other Alexandrians. Thing. Hmm? Origin and other Alexandrians do mention Jesus as human soul. And that, right, that right. was one but, of the thing. Yeah. But but my point being, I think he's using his body in that way. And and the reason that I think we, we have to have him having Jesus having a human soul is the parody that he creates with Theosis. Right. Because he very clearly, he, he very clearly believes in the bodily resurrection, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. He doesn't think that deification is just of our soul. Right. But that it is of it's our a, soul and our body, which is a discontinuity with origin. Right. That I, That's an interesting question. And I think it would be, I that it, it would require me to reread. Athanasius yeah. to to think about have to how go with he, some detail. I think yeah to, yeah <laughs> yeah and, because I to me it feels like the goal is inwards and upwards for Athanasius and that this is connect he he does love Saint Anthony of the Desert of course that's like one of his theological yeah. heroes and he writes Anthony's biography yeah and I do think that there is more than a little bit of Gnosticism still floating around out there in the Upper Nile Desert. And right. but that, that he's opposed to it. He's getting the books gotten rid of. He's yeah. But out one one seeds. one can criticize Gnosticism with getting a little bit painted by it in the process. Uh, I think uh, Origen is an example of someone who's perfectly willing to criticize Gnosticism. But I'd still be like, but what about that part? And what about that part? And what about that yeah. part? Well, there is uh, Gnosticism is sort of like you know fascism or communism in the modern world. It's. Yeah. Anybody to the right of me is a fascist and to the left of me is a communist. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I, I do think that 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 is part of my argument that I think that Athanasius is probably an iconoclast because I do think he has that similar thing that you see in Clement and Origen. That is that sort of goal. The goal of the spiritual life is inward and upward and away from the realm of sense. And that he does very much talk that way specifically in his condemnation of the um, uh, idolatry of the pagans. Yeah. And I just, I, I disagree. Like I have a different read of St. Anthony too. I have a different read of asceticism, but I mean, your, your read on this is within, well, within the framework of the Western theological tradition. Right. As taken that read. I mean, this is one of the big disagreements between East and West is about St. Dionysius the Areopagite, right? The West firmly convinced he's a Neoplatonist and we say he's not a Neoplatonist at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a completely different read so <laughs> that's yeah. there's a little bit of an impasse there but yeah you're not out of you're not out of left field but uh yeah I understand. I have a very yeah. different read yeah <laughs> all right well we should probably wrap up soon it's getting a little bit late for both of us uh <laughs> any closing thoughts that you wanted to get off your chest before we we part no, it was, it was uh, good talking to you. I hope this is helpful for some folks out there, yeah. or at least entertains them <laughs> on a long drive or something. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, you're, my conversations with you have absolutely by far the record like average length watch on my YouTube metrics. You're like in a category by yourself <laughs> in terms of average attention span that you can generate in, in the in well, if they listen to lord of spirits they're used to like long yes. yeah <laughs> yeah. So. yeah all right well anyway i i always appreciate your time uh i think this helped clarify my understanding of 
kind of our differences. And, uh, you know, I, I think that you pushed me a little bit that maybe there really is a way for it to be plausible to have iconography in your church or your synagogue. And that just to not bother you that when you're arguing against pagans about their idolatry, it just doesn't come to mind uh, because it's just such a clear distinction in your mind Um, that I think is more plausible. And I think I I better understand where you're coming from with that. Um, Still not sure about John 10 though. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's, just clarifying where where we actually disagree is helpful, mm-hmm. right? Getting getting to sort of the the root of things, right, and and understanding them. Yeah, I agree. And you're a very patient and kind and long suffering conversation partner who keeps an audience's attention. So uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, everybody.